Good evening, everybody. It is 6 o'clock. Welcome to the April 8th City Council meeting. I would like to open tonight's meeting in memoriam. Um, Roberta Hewen passed away on March 23rd, and she is a not only a former city council member, but a former mayor of Gilroy, and even more than that, she was a trailblazer because Gilroy was incorporated in 1870, and it took until 1977 when she was the first woman elected to the city council, and then she was elected as mayor and served two terms, elected consecutively after being a city council member, and then it would take 40 years after that for the second mayor, to, second woman to be elected mayor, which is me sitting here now. So that's, that's quite a feat. So I want to acknowledge Roberta Hewen. Um, we're in memory uh, here, opening the meeting in memory of her. Her daughter, Gwyneth, has walked in, and her son-in-law, Ed, both um, very involved in her life. So, all right, there we go. Okay, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance, if everyone could still stand. And Council Member Marks, would you please lead us? Okay, if you'd please remain standing, we should have, yes, um, Rabbi Debbie Israel, who's going to give us the invocation. The following prayer, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the following prayer was <coughs> authored by Christian, Jewish, and Muslim clergy and was used in many places in interreligious worships around the time of the Gulf War in 1991, and it feels appropriate tonight. Eternal God of the universe, there is no God but you. Great and wonderful are your works. Wondrous are your ways. Thank you for the many splendid variety of your creation. Thank you for the many ways we affirm your presence and purpose and the freedom to do so. Forgive our violation of your creation. Forgive our violence toward each other. We stand in awe and gratitude for your persistent love for each and all of your children, Christian, Jew, Muslim, as well as those of other faiths. Grant to our leaders here attributes of the strong, mutual respect in words and deed, restraint in the exercise of power, and the will for peace with justice. Amen. Thank you. Okay, City Clerk's report on posting the agenda, followed by roll call. The agenda was posted last Thursday, April 4th at 3.35 p.m. Councilmember Bracco? Yeah, here. Councilmember Armendaris? Here. Councilmember Marks? Here. Councilmember Hilton? Here. Councilmember Klein? Here. Councilmember Tovar? Here. Mayor Blankley? Here. All present. All right, thank you. Um, item 1.6 is orders of the day. We have none. 1.7, employee introductions. Uh, Chief Espinosa? I understand you're going to introduce us to a new employee. Madam Mayor, members of council and members of the community, very happy to introduce our newest addition to our team, Michael DeFreitz, who started on the 17 as our newest community service officer. Michael comes from the customer service world, having uh, held jobs in, uh, with youth ranging from food services as a youth to medical administration after graduating high school. He earned an electrical certificate at Foothill College. He moved into the fitness world as a professional trainer and spent some time as a caregiver, later moved into construction as a union commercial electrician. He also worked on the side as a fitness coach and an MMA coach. That's mixed martial arts. Enjoys cooking, gardening, hiking, spending time with his wife and dogs, and he enjoys competing in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts competitions. And I believe he just won a fight here last week. He's a son of Robin Whitman, husband to Katrina DeFreitz, and brother to a local horse trainer and union election, Jason DeFreitz. Please help me welcome Michael DeFreitz. I've been a, a member of the community here for the last three years. Um, and I'm proud to say that, and I'm very proud now to have the opportunity to serve, and I hope to honor this great city and continue to do so for a long time. Thank you, everybody, for this opportunity. Thank you. We're proud to have you. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Chief. Okay, under ceremonial items, we have one proclamation recognizing April 2024 as Fair Housing Month. Is Josie Fulton here from Project Sentinel? Okay, moving on to item three, um, council correspondence. We have none. Item four, presentation to the council. We have our annual city historian presentation to the council. Toby Eichelberry, do you want to take the, take the stand and get us going? Evening, Madam Mayor and C members of the Council. Uh, once again, thank you for having uh, the privilege of uh, being in this role. Uh, it's been another fun-filled year of uh, sitting in here working as the historian, uh, barking on getting on opportunity to travel up and down the state, meeting a lot of different representatives from various cities and esteemed members in the, uh, the historical realm. Um, just as a reminder, the uh, goal of the city historian is to provide the civic history of Gilroy. We're partnering in with the city clerk's office as well, working with the Gilroy Museum and Historical Society to basically the bringing in, providing about the city's past and education and providing uh, additional uh, growth into the realm of the community heritage that we're working with. So some Big things that which we accomplished, uh, as you all are aware, I've been working on the transcription services for all of our minutes, resolutions, and ordinances. Uh, it's uh, a small undertaking. Uh, there's several thousand records that are sitting out there. But I just wanted to give you guys an update of where I'm currently at. Um, as you see on the charts uh, up above here, I got about 22% of all of the minutes completed. Um, the resolutions a little less. There are some large amount of resolutions that were accomplished in the 50s and 60s. That's going to slow me down for a little bit as I get caught up in that realm. And then uh, various orients as all. Well. But in total, uh, about 13% is done. So I've accomplished basically the years of 1868 through 1871. And then right now I've been working heavily in 1920s to 1950s. Uh, the reason why we ended up jumping is I had a lot of requests coming in uh, dealing more about the history around the 30s and the 40s. And so in order for me to be more uh, amped and be able to answer uh, you know, good uh, um, uh, scenarios and, and resolutions and that, I jumped into this realm. Um, so right now, in all, um, as you can see, there's a little over a thousand records that I've completed already. I'm trying to be on the goal of trying to do about four to five hundred of these per each year, um, as well as um, continuing to do my writings. And so I've actually, of those of you who have read, I did the history of the Bear Flag Revolt, and basically seen from the eyes from Gilroy of how we actually had members who actually were part of the Bear Flag Revolt who actually sat there and witnessed the raising of the flag when it happened in there. Um, I'm also kind of shifted over with looking at the recognized and observed state holidays and basically defining what those are and what the history of each one of those are. So I've actually kind of created a timeline from the inception of 1950 all the way up to present of all of the different holidays that we recognize formally and we honor and observe as well. So I'll be writing a bit uh, on each one of them. Uh, Two of the first pieces I did was California's Emissions Day and Labor Day. And so those are, are in there. So um, I, this year, year I did a lot of travel, like I said, up and down the state. I met with mayors of various cities, uh, some hit city historians, docents as well. Uh, one of the best ones I had, I actually got invited out to Catalina Island, and the mayor gave me a tour of the island, uh, talking about its rich history and, and its past and all that. And the, basically everything that they're working on today was some of the sustainability movements that they're working on to try to improve their energy resources there. Uh, I've been working as well with a lot of the California mission chains as I've been working on a couple projects, working on trying to do uh, photojournalism of each of the missions and then trying to bring it forward as well. And then working with a lot of the independent cities as well, trying to talk with city historians, what roles the city historians can participate and work in and in there. Um, along with the traveling path, I actually met a few key um, individuals. Um, I was sitting down in Orange County. I was at the fairgrounds. I don't know if you guys have ever been down there. There's a Heroes of Hall for uh, basically for all of the, uh, the veterans. 
And I actually got to talking with them with the, one of the docents there. Actually ended up being somebody who knew the original commander who actually managed the military unit that was stationed here during World War II. So this kind of led for me doing a lot of stuff with uh, the, the, the 40s. So we got to talk about how the, uh, the National Guard got set up here and all of them. And then right when so I was talking with him, I actually got a chance to meet Henry Hecker's descendant, uh, who was also the great-grandson of Henry Hecker. And so we got to talking about you know, how he's got a couple of memorial uh, signs of the original signs that got hung up on Hecker Pass and all that. He actually resigns now down in Southern California right there. So that's it um, I have for this, this uh, the year as we're doing a year review. And, uh, any questions? Council members, any questions? No, thank you very much for the thank presentation you. and for all thank your you. work. Okay. That brings us to public, yes, public comment. Public comment, um, this is the portion of the agenda where um, Members of the public can comment on things that are not on the agenda. Uh, I need to ask how many speakers we have. I see four on my list. Is that that's, correct. that's about right? Okay. Then we'll start with Richard Legends, followed by Ron Kirkish, Robert Zapeda, Maddie Scariot. So if you could all please be up in the front, that would be great. Okay, and you have um, three minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Richard Legend. Oh, you need to start the timer first? You need a timer. That's oh, okay. All right. Go ahead. You could start. All right. Thank you. The timer going yet. Uh, my name is Richard Legends. Uh, some of you may or may not know me. I am uh, one of the co owners for Covell, which is a rooftop patio that's going to be built here in downtown Gilroy. Um, we are on the final stretch for our business. Um, we should be opening within the next three weeks in Gourmet Alley, considering that there is um, a lot of alley work going on that we all probably know of. Um, so I just know the city's working directly with us um, to ensure we can get people in there safely. I just want to make sure, or hoping we can have um, with our uh, occupancy levels at over 49, we need two emergency exits, and we only have one with the alleyway being closed. So just wanted to make sure if there's the city can help us, guide us through those, um, to get us through code. <laughs> and then um, I just felt like the rollout was just a little bit not as informative as it should have been. Um, I don't know whose fault that was. I don't know. I'm not going to blame anyone. Um, but I just wanted to just get up here and reintroduce myself and hopefully... Uh, Hoping for the best of this outcome for Gourmet Alley. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. My mistake. The speaker should be in the center podium oh, here. Yeah. Oh, no, it was my bad. I really, I was focusing on the fact. Okay. And then you should be able to see the clock right there. Can too. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I was, people complained because last week I was, my, they said I, they couldn't hear my voice. Um, I'm going to be speaking. I'm going to be setting the foundation for uh, PBA 2050. Uh, the plan for MTC and ABAG tonight. And uh, I wanted to show you, this is the uh, plan. This is for the ABAG for the 2050. It's fairly thick, as you can see. But I also found that they have a codicil to the plan. It's uh, toward a shared future strategies to maintain travel demand. And uh, they call it a spec uh, prospective paper. But it's, it's, it's actually very even worse than some of the stuff that's in the plan itself that I'll be speaking to. Um, and again, it's a, it's a, the partners are Association of Bay Area Governments and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. So these two things I'm going to be speaking about over the next several meetings. Again, I'm going to be setting the uh, foundation tonight. Uh, when you talk about, when you, you know, if I say uh, uh, Gavin Newsom, you all know that that means he's uh, the governor of, of California. If I say uh, President Biden, he's the president of the United States. But who is ABAG? Who's MTC? I don't think very many people know. And that's what I'm going to be telling you tonight. So who, makes, who is it that makes up their leadership and membership? Who created their plan, Bay Area 2050 report, and its codicil? During my last presentation to the council and the community, I deliberately stated, quote, 
the MTC ABAG echo chambers of the extreme radical left's invective Spingola demagogues. And that's what I'm going to try to introduce you tonight. In fact, the decision makers are, in most cases, all politicians or their politically assigned appointees who typically reside on the far left side of the political ledger, many residing on the very far left, which explains these extremely radical plans that Mr. Hilton has stated on multiple occasions is his agenda to impose on us Gilroyans to bring us into the 21st century. Fortunately, I have a list of the uh, names of these people and their titles, and I will read them directly. Nick Jose Fowitz is the vice chair, and he's the San Francisco mayor appointee. San Francisco mayor appointee. Cindy Sanchez, Chavez, he's the Santa Clara, she's a Santa Clara representative. But Cindy is also a, on the board for the MTC and ABAG, and she's altered, also an alternate for LAFCO. She has her tentacles deep in our communities. Okay, I have three minutes now. Is it not showing for him? No, it wasn't. Okay. Is it over already? It's been three minutes, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, That's well, okay. I will, I'll pick it up again next okay. week. Okay. Yeah, it should be visible for the speaker, too. Okay. Okay, next speaker is Robert Cepeda. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, I'm Robert Cepeda. So I've been doing some research, some thinking. I didn't attend the last meeting, but is this on? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was trying to figure out what is the main issue that we ought, all, we all ought to look in, and whether that's federal, state, and local. Now, of course, we want to say local, and I couldn't help but find myself going back to the same place. And there's a saying that says, follow the money. But then I did another search around, and I realized, wait a minute, what controls our money? And that is, as we all should know, the Federal Reserve. Now, we are aware that it's tax season, and I believe the 15th is, you know, when taxes are due. And, you know, I look through my paid stuff, I'm sure everyone else does, and I realize, why, why does the government take so much money out of my check before I even receive it? You know, I could be providing that to a bunch of hairs here, um, you know, people in the local community, regardless whether that's a church or a nonprofit organization, whether you still have trust in that or not. But um, my point is, you know, how much is, of our dollars being taxed? You know, an employer has to pay taxes just to pay his employee, right, an employer tax, if I'm not mistaken. And then, of course, the personal income tax off that person's check that's being paid, and then they have to pay taxes through a sales tax. And then what else is there? Oh, if you own a property, it's a mortgage tax, and so on and so forth. So this is like a circulation. It's, it's, it's a Ponzi scheme. And what is our money backed by? It's backed by nothing. Not, no precious metal. I mean, we call it the petrodollar, but do we really have any petroleum in our system? I mean, all of it's drained to the bottom. And so I fear that we are running to the end of the cliff. And then they already announced, what, FedCoin, which is going to affect everyone. And I'm trying to make this clear that it will affect this jurisdiction, Gilroy as well, myself, you all. And so it is good to be prepared and be aware. And with my remaining time left, I do want to say, yes, I am showing, presenting a problem, but we all should be prepared for a solution. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Maddie Scariot from Poppy Jasper. Hi. 
Um, I'm Maddie Scarriott. I'm the director of the Poppy Jasper Film Festival. Hopefully you've all heard of it. Um, this year is really exciting. We have 72 events in eight days in four cities and 18 different venues. We have hundreds of filmmakers coming from all over the world this year. It's very exciting. We actually have two already here in the hotel and two we're picking up tonight in San Francisco and another one coming in tomorrow morning. So um, there, you know, what, what what I realize is that we sort of stack all these really fun events throughout the week and they're all excited about coming. And so tomorrow night is our pre-party at Morgan's Cove. And if you, uh, if you sign up to be a volunteer, you can go. <laughs> or you buy a VIP pass, you can go. Um, there's filmmakers are going to be there and our sponsors and things like that. But, but it, the cool thing is, is that they're staying longer and longer. This year they're staying like four or five days instead of just two or three days. And some are staying all the whole week. So I just want to let you know this is pretty exciting when you have people that are coming, you know, from England and Spain and Argentina and, and they're coming here with their films and there's, tens of thousands of, there's like 10, 000, over 10,000 film festivals in the world. It's very special when they choose our, your festival. And so I hope you come and check it out. You, know, you can just watch a film for like $10 or, or if you want to go to the Poppy Bash, you can go by yourself for $35. If you want to get a table, you can get a table. You know, I just hope to see you all there and I hope you enjoy it. And, and I'd like to see the theaters filled up with uh, filmmakers. Um, when, uh, when I, oh, so my mom. Open it, open it, yeah, <laughs> uh, my mom. Um, she um, she she helps pass out posters, and she walks up and down the downtowns of Morgan Hill and Gilroy, and she's like she passed out all 50 posters for both cities, and and she said that she constantly heard from the downtown businesses how they love it when Poppy Jasper's in town because they do really well, and it's not just the restaurants, it's the shops and things. They really do want to explore. And, and learn. We've had some of them ask for garlic uh, ice cream and, and things like that. So it's, it's really exciting to have them. And so you'll see them. They'll have lanyards that say filmmaker on it. Stop them and say hi and say welcome. Um, we've had people take them out to dinner, take them out to lunch, you know, so yeah. Can I tell everybody how to get tickets? Yeah, you can just go to pjiff.org and uh, there's a, a little red ticket right there. It says festival tickets and so you can click on it and it's pretty easy. If you have any questions, just call me, you know, uh, or email me. Whatever. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. Maddie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other speakers? I don't see any. No. Okay. Then that brings us to Council Member reports. Council Member Baca. That's a report. Council Member Armendariz. Thank you, Mayor. A couple things. Um, I attended the uh, Santa Clara Valley Habitat. Um, Governance and Implementation Board meeting along with Council Member Marks. Um, some of the things we reviewed included an impact fee, which was approved for burrowing owl zones. There are protected species and there's a uh, multi-year plan to um, help protect them and help them up their population. And so that fee is attached to some of that work. We also had a report from our public advocacy um, Committee uh, we received, uh, who received and approved our audit and our financial report. Um, we acquired the second half of the Richmond Ranch, which was an additional 1,200 acres for preserve. Um, we had acquired the original 944 acres from them in January. So that, um, that contributes tremendously to keeping a uh, consistent, um, geographically consistent, um, protected land along um, our Pacheco Pass area. And then uh, we selected a chair and a vice chair who uh, continue to be Council Member Spring from Morgan Hill and Vice Chair is Council Member Cohen from San Jose. I also attended on the 5th the Housing Committee, um, the Housing and Community Development Adv Advocacy Committee. I'm sorry. <laughs> That one has a long name. But um, we distributed uh, CDBG funds uh, from different funding streams, but all fall under the umbrella of our CDBG, our Community Development Block Grant funds, which is, does not come out of the general fund. Um, and that's at the county level. 
uh, that was $2.8 million and $1.1 million from the HOME program, which is an investment program for community development, uh, for a total of $4.3 million. The agencies uh, which do service in our um, community and, uh, and who are granted funding included Community Solutions, La Isla Pacifica, the Magical Bridge Playground, which is in Morgan Hill, but still in our neck of the woods, uh, Project Sentinel, the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, and the Sacred Heart Homeless Prevention Services Project. Um, and then lastly, I did attend and complete the uh, JEDI training alongside city staff and um, some of our city uh, commissioners and board members uh, where we reviewed and discussed personal, professional, and organizational perspectives on the issues of equity, justice, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, I found it to be well facilitated. It allowed space for some really tough um, subjects and conversations. I appreciated that. That's it. Council Member Marks. Uh, yes, Gilroy Gardens had their opening um, weekend a few weekends ago with 10,000 more visitors this year than last year. Wow. Last year in 2023, Gilroy Gardens had 460,000 visitors for the year, and hopefully they would like to push it up to close to a half million. Lakeside is going to be opening on Mother's Day, so bring your towel and your sunscreen and kids and go out and enjoy a day of fun in the sun and water. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock here in Council Chambers, we'll have a downtown committee meeting. If you can't make it down here, you can always watch us on video. All right, thank you. Council Member Hilton. Thank you from the Valley Transportation Authority Policy Advisory Committee. We had an update on the equitable vehicle miles traveled mitigation grant project. California shifted from focusing on vehicular congestion level of service to total amount of driving called VMT for transportation analysis under CEQA. The goal of the project is to develop the framework for an equitable program to reduce the amount of driving from land use developments in Santa Clara County. That works, that works across jurisdictional lines and improves travel options. The project is focusing on equity in both the process, study and engagement events, and the outcome and program, a program framework that supports VMT reduction investments that equity, priority, communities identified as most beneficial. Since the project commenced in May of 2023, VTA has wor been working closely with its consultant team and project partners to document existing needs, VMT mitigation practices, coordinate with local jurisdiction staff, and they hosted a booth at last year's La Verna Festival in downtown Gilroy. Silicon Valley Clean Energy, the SVCE board received the financial audit results for the 2022-2023 fiscal year and approved the mid-year budget, which, projects, which projects depositing $112.6 million into the reserves. SVCE has built up strong financial reserves to be able to withstand regulatory changes in energy market price volatility while continuing to deliver on its promise and provide rate stability for customers. Funding was allocated for decarbonization programs. $34 million in already authorized program funding was allocated to several programs to support SVC residential and commercial customers in their efforts to upgrade efficient electronic technologies and move away from polluting fossil fuels. To date, SVC has, has allocated $116 million to customer programs that help make Silicon Valley a cleaner, safer, and healthier region. The SVC board authorized the approval of $14 million contract with Frank Franklin Energy Services to support the program design and implementation services of a single family residential installation program. Incentives through the existing Future Fit rebate program have helped early adopters and do it yourselfers go electric, but deeper assistance may be needed to achieve greater scale and a broader set of customer participation. To, to enable large scale electronic electric equipment adoption, the single-family residential installation program will aim to reduce the barriers of contractor reliability and cost, incentive program effective effectiveness, and emergency replacement needs. SVC also launched the Go Electric Advisor, a concierge hotline service intended to answer questions, connect customers to resources, and walk them through the steps necessary to take action. This service provides an additional level of, of assistance on top of, of available incentives. The service will be launched along with Peninsula Clean Energy, allowing both CCAs to save on administrative costs. Thank you. Council Member Klein. Yes, no report. <clears throat> Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. A couple things. I would like to wish uh, Mariam Nelson a happy 100th birthday, um, mother of Temple owner Dan Nelson, who she celebrated here in Gilroy. 
I would not be surprised if she celebrates our 120th one day. She's in such great health. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the Poppy Jasper, but I'm glad Maddie um, talked about that. Again, April 10th through the 17th throughout Gilroy. I want to thank our city administrator and city staff who worked quickly to get the banner in our downtown. I'm happy to say it was uh, printed by one of our local companies here, Straight 8 Sports, so thank you for that. Um, and again, Maddie left, but I want to congratulate her for all the local and national media that coverage that she's got in representing Gilroy with pride and class. So thank you, Maddie. Finally, I just want to uh, congratulate all our uh, Gilroy students who were recently admitted into Santa Clara University, undergrad and grad school. So great to see so many of our uh, local students going to Santa Clara. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Um, I thought there was a great article on the Poppy Jasper Film Festival and the Mercury uh, today, so thank you, uh, Luis, for, for doing that. Um, I do host uh, filmmakers. I've got two coming in on Wednesday and two on Friday. Looking for, and I already have my VIP pass, so hopefully everybody else does the same. Okay, um, Santa Clara Valley Water Joint, Joint Water Resources Committee and SCRA uh, both met. Those of us on that committee uh, met on Wednesday. And what I want to share from those meetings is um, that we are making great efforts to increase the number of places to which we can deliver recycled water. Our scraw plant is amazing, and every single drop of the water, the wastewater that is treated there, uh, that is in demand, that is asked for in the winter months, nobody's asking for water, but in the summer, when they are, Every drop that is treated is recycled and used. And so the challenge is to have a greater delivery span so that more people have access to the recycled water. Um, you may all know that last September, Valley Water, we celebrated the opening of their newest pipeline here in Gilroy from the scraw plant to the southeast, excuse me, southwest part of Gilroy out towards Glen Loma. So that's a new area for recycled water delivery, and we are beginning discussions. This is together with Morgan Hill, because Scraw is Gilroy and Morgan Hill, 60% funded by Gilroy, 40% funded by Morgan Hill, uh, to start looking at the potential for purified water. So exciting things going on there. Um, lastly, uh, the VTA Board of Directors also met, and the, the issue I want to keep everybody abreast of is this... Um, gigantic tax measure that is expected to come before us in 2026. Um, it is for the nine Bay Area counties. Um, this is now called SB 1031. It's changed its numbers a couple of times. But this is uh, State Senator Scott Weiner, um, who is a very, very big advocate for transportation. That part is great. But what happened at the VTA board meeting was to take a position of oppose unless there are some significant changes because Santa Clara County brings in, believe it or not, 30%, 28.68% of the revenues of all the nine counties. Uh, the next one is Alameda County at 22.64, and then it's San Mateo County at 10.98, and the rest are under 10, excuse me, it's Contra, Contra Costa County at 11.15. The rest of the nine counties are all below 10%. So the issue is when you have a larger agency being in charge of transportation, how, where is the control that the money that's going in from the different locations is getting a return, you know, that all the transportation isn't happening outside of our area. So it was a long discussion at the VTA board meeting. It's been a long discussion several times. Where it is right now is a position to oppose. Caltrain did the same thing. I want everyone to know. And we do have excellent representation on MTC. So we, at least on this, we do have Cindy Chavez and we do have Matt Mahan and we do have uh, Margaret Abicoga who have both been arguing, I mean, fighting hard at MTC level for what this does to Santa Clara County and particularly South Santa Clara County. And Dev Davis is our representative. She's a San Jose council member on Caltrain's board. And she, uh, she was talking Gilroy specifically at Caltrain. So we are being heard. We, are, we know it's just that the, the entities that are trying to improve transportation, of course, it's a lot more money if you pool it all from the counties, but divvying that up to make sure that we in Gilroy, who already have the least amount of transportation in our county with just VTA as our uh, organizing group, um, this is something that's very concerning. So depending on how it's written, so I just want everyone to know that that's the, the latest news on that. Okay, I'm going to move on then to consent calendar. 
We have item 6.1 and 6.2. Does anyone wish to pull an item from consent? Uh, I don't wish to pull one, but I do. Uh, I'd be happy to make a motion if you after you take public comment. But there is some language change that I want to make in 6.2 ahead of time. So that would be pulling it then. Okay. So uh, let me go to public comment and do we, no public comment. Okay. So can we take a vote on 6.1? So second. Okay. We have a motion and a second for 6.1. Do we need a a roll call vote or? Okay, sure. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Armanderas? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Klein? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blankley? Yes. Okay, thank you. That, yeah, that passed unanimously. 6.2? Sure, so 6.2. Um, so the resolution uh, that, I, that I put forward in the, my fair memo back on May 18th at this this body approved the consent calendar item. It has everything that's in there, but it doesn't match the language uh, that is submitted in my fair memo. Um, specifically, it's, it's basically not the language of the ARCH resolution, but the ending of it. Um, so what I'd like to do is just substitute out the ending motion for the ending part uh, for what it says right here, which is normally what we do on city council resolution process. We're kind of mixing the mayor's proclamation process with the city uh, council resolution process. So my proposed language change would be um, now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Gilroy hereby proclaims April 2024 as Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month and encourages everyone to celebrate the power of the arts in our community. So that would be my, that would be my request. It's probably just a simple, simple error, but that's my, it's, that's my it's request. It's not an error. Um, like the staff said at the meeting, was that we were trying to make things more consistent. We have had consistency <laughs> issues ever since I've been the mayor, and it's just you can't get to everything. It's like in your marriage. You have to pick your battles and get to them <laughs> one at a time. Um, this one is we were trying to get the wording consistent when council members who are requesting a resolution for something that is ceremonial, that it be treated the same as anything that's ceremonial. That was not in my fair memo, and you're, you're, what you're doing right now is you're, you're, you're taking past president and you're trying to change it, and that's not the way it works. Mayor's proclamation process is one thing. A city council resolution process is a completely separate thing, and you're, okay. you're, you're switching them up. So this, is a, this says, hereby proclaims. It, 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 we don't need to go over I'd be happy to make the motion if someone could second it, and then we can call the question. I'm not trying to get into a discussion or a debate, but you are mixing lines right here. It doesn't matter what it says. This is a city council resolution process, and there's a mayor's office proclamation process, and you literally replaced the mayor's proclamation process at the end. You took that language and you put that in there. Okay, there's and that's not, not a, what we approved. There's not a mayor's proclamation process. The proclamation process was approved by the city council. It's and it's all run by office. you, and they're not all brought here, okay. and they're not all put on our agenda, and they're not voted <laughs> on. And if you want to get in discussions on ones that you've provided this okay, community, so would you like to sign? Would you like to sign it too? Just wondering. Okay. Why don't I get a okay. second? Please? I don't hear a second. That's and then the let's call the question. Julie, yep. Can I ask Julie? <clears throat> um, sorry, thank no, you. No, it would actually yeah. be a question for Jimmy or for, for, okay, or for, for the city clerk. Well, maybe Jimmy, can you? help answer council member Hilton's concerns? Well, I think before we can engage in discussion, has, doesn't there... I would like to have a second, please. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, council, I, I really don't have a lot to do with this kind of topic. It is something that the city clerk and the mayor work on, but I do know that we do try to have the language consistent for all types of documents. I think the debate is whether it's consistent or not, and I do not think that's something that I can really help you with right now. Okay. Then can we can, I have a question. Um, what was the process and the wording prior to this proclamation? It, it's not a proclamation. It's a resolution. I'm sorry. Well, that's the resolution. thing. That's the thing. We're trying to be – I was trying – and so was the city clerk, and that's what we staff said. If you go back and watch the meeting, we said that we were going to word it consistently. So what it had said last year as a resolution – is that be it resolved that the city council of the city of Gilroy hereby proclaim. And what it says now is, now therefore, I, Marie Blankley, mayor of the city of Gilroy, along with my fellow council members, do hereby proclaim. And that's because it is a ceremonial item. This is not a resolution. No, of it, it's ordinance. not a ceremonial item. That is not the way I referenced it in my fair memo. That is not what we voted on on March 18th. That is what you are putting into this right now. 
into that conversation. Okay, maybe the city clerk did wants we, to. Did we ever discuss changing that language? We discussed making it consistent. But, and this specific language or the policy, uh, the, uh, the specific, procedures this, to do this? <laughs> there's no change to the, to the content of his resolution other than That's he doesn't want my name there. He's not contending that, I'm, that there's I'm a change signing to the it. content. So. You, <laughs> you sign name. every single resolution, right. city resolution. Correct. Yeah. But this is a ceremonial resolution. No, that is what you are saying it is. That is oh. not what I am saying it is, and that's not what a city resolution is. Okay. Mayor, could I suggest something? Because um, I've seen in others, thank you for the feedback. I've seen in other uh, cities where they, if, if the concern is kind of how it's phrased, other cities will put the name of the mayor and every single council member in that last line there. Huh. So it recognizes everyone. So I don't know if that's... A possible solution. I, I'm actually just looking to follow past precedent. So, just city resolutions end with this, proclamations end with the other one. That's what Jeff, I'm would you for. like to tell us your your, uh, your take on this? <clears throat> like you said, we're trying to be consistent, yeah. and this is more. Most resolutions that the city does is towards the work that they do. And this is a part of the work that we do. Supporting arts as a business, this resolution will be used by not only us for future grants, but for the community with future grants. Okay, can that's we let the, the city that's clerk, the That's the reason why we her. want it as a resolution. You're interrupting her. But it's more of like when we do um, resolutions for whether it's CDBG or any of the other entities through um, community development, those, resolu those are resolutions of work that the city does, and it states in there exactly what the city is doing um, with that resolution. This is just proclaiming that the city wants to recognize a month as um, this arts, arts and culture. culture. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't put forward what the city's going to do for that, and that's what resolutions are used for. Thank you for that answer. Okay, Joel, well then would you like me to pull it and, and, try and rewrite it? Is that... Is that is that what you? Is that what no, the will you, of the council? I'm not asking you. I know, but you've already pulled it. It's I'm not pulled. asking you. Do you? Was the will of the council? Would you like me to, to reword this so that this resolution can be used out there in the general public and be used by us? That's going to go after funding for arts and grants and murals and a whole lot more. Would you like me to change it so that I can actually put physical stuff in there so that it matches the same style of city resolutions that we have that we have always done? No, is that I, something that you want me to do? I'm not asking you. I didn't say you were asking me. Okay. I think it's time to vote. Okay, you have a motion and a second. All right, fine. And so Follow I think that needs to be I voted do have on. A, I do have a question, though, mm -hmm. but, um, because my concern is that um, a process or a practice was changed without discussion here. 100%. And that, that's, that's my concern. I don't and appreciate it, that happening, and I think that it um, circumvents our process, right, and, and the the public's right to hear and chime in on things, whether or not, uh, you know, some of us might consider them um, minor changes or for the sake of consistency. I think for the sake of consistency, we ultimately have to discuss things and make those decisions as a group. Yeah, this is not what I proposed. It was done, it was what this, yeah, it was between, yeah, it was between uh, staff to make it consistent. This wasn't my doing. It's But it doesn't matter. It's, it's, we have a motion and we have a second. So I think it's time to vote so that we know if what you are saying is something that the majority of the council wants to support. Well, you know what? Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm very unclear, you know, as to what's going on here. I would like to hear from my fellow council members on how they feel. If it's something, if, if we can change the wording We're not to be able... Okay. Yes, that's exactly what I... Yes, that what is I, what he's proposing. Yes. <laughs> changing the wording so that we're able to get grant funding... I like that. That's what this, then, that, that exactly is, that's exactly what this will be used for. Because then <laughs> I can get some money for the murals on, you know, behind railroad. And you could so, use this resolution just like people used it last year, Councilmember Marks, for that same exact reason. And so, it can't be used worded this way? This is because of the word proclaim. This is all because the word proclaim no, it's not. is what, there. What was your, what well, was your okay, but wait a minute. I, I, no, answer the mayor, because I'm wondering that, too. As it's <laughs> written right now, it can't be used for, for grants? She is physically changed Eric, can and you answer altered. Her question? No, no, but the... answer my question. Yes. No, can okay. it be? Why not? 
Because this is this this literally is a pro, it's changing it to a proclamation is what it is. No, it's not. It's yes, a resolution. It no, it's going to have a res- the, You're using the exact language. It's right from here. It. Resolution. And, it, and if 2024. you look at this, if you look at this resolution compared to every other resolution that this body has ever passed, back to what our city historian said, it's different. It can still be used. It got changed. It got changed. And if, if we want to set precedent for moving forward, then we'll remember this day is the day that okay, that precedent Okay, who has an answer for us? I think the city clerk Beth, mentioned that it should to? contain <laughs> language. Uh, the content should be different, including um, work that we're doing, accomplishments that we've made, work plans from the commission, et cetera, right? And so if that's what right. Council Member Hilton uh, wants to do to change it so that um, it'll be – Consistent, and we can not change it uh, without okay. consent from the author. I'm sorry. Then we I can't, think that's we're what not, we need to we're do. We're not going to have requests from council that. members going to staff when council hasn't I'm not voted on this I'm yet. I'm quoting what she just You're, told us. Fine. I'm not requesting anything But from her. this needs to be addressed by the council first. And so we have a motion in a second. I asked for a vote. Council member Marks wanted another question answered. It got answered. So, oh, no, I don't think it got answered. You don't think it got answered? No, because well, I'm still waiting to hear. If we leave it as is, can this be used for future grants? If, if what it needs, it is a resolution. A resolution. Okay. He doesn't like the way the no, wording but, uh, is in it, but it's a resolution <laughs> that is proclaiming the month of April right. as Arts and Creativity Month. It, is, it remains a resolution proclaiming the month of April as Arts and Creativity Month. It just says, now, therefore, I, Marie Blankley, instead of the... I'm Marie Blankley, together with my colleagues. It doesn't say the city, the city council of the city of Gilroy, but it proclaims April as Arts and Creativity Month, which is why the wording is consistent with anything that we proclaim. This month is this, this month is that. We do lots of those. And this is how the wording is, and I am the one who signs them. So this is just proclaiming the month. Yes, so maybe this is Council proclaiming the month. Could you write... A separate one to be to be given to us later that could be used for grant funding. Would that work? But the one you think- plan to use for grant funding still proclaims April. It's the same. It's, it's All right. the content is the same. I think, if I may, and correct me, I think the difference is a proclamation and a resolution. Right. But this so is a no, no, look in no, your no, packet because right, it is no, a resolution. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. No, I, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Is yeah. if this said proclamation. Um, then I think that changes right. kind of the... It's a resolution But it's proclaiming. a resolution. I understand. I, right. But I understand what Council Member Hilton is saying. Yeah. Um, but I guess that's the bottom line is if this is a resolution, then it should have the same teeth as, you know, more than a proclamation. And it does. And it does. So, well, it does. The language is consistent. Okay. It's not consistent. It, it is consistent no, for the not. type of resolution. Okay. It is not consistent. Again, we need to vote. Proclaim Can we please versus vote? Resolve. <laughs> <laughs> Why, well, you guys? This is a really long time on something that you started it. No, you did. You pulled it. You pulled it. Would you like okay. me to do the vote? I think mm-hmm. we should take a vote. Councilmember oh. Rocco. No. Councilmember Armendariz. Yes. Councilmember Marks. No. Councilmember Hilton. No. Councilmember mm-hmm. Klein. No. Councilmember Tovar. Yes. Mayor Blankley. I'm no, but I'm confused. You voted I no to your own motion? You want to ask the city attorney if that's allowed? N- I just no, was I making sure you didn't well. make a mistake. Let's move on. Okay, think- let's move on. Thank you. All right. Item 7, bids and proposals. We have none. Yeah. Item 8 is public hearings. We have none. Item 9 is unfinished business. We have none. Item 10, introduction of new business. Consent to the city contribution towards candidate statement costs and adjustment of the voluntary campaign expenditure ceiling for the 2024 general municipal election. Uh, Who is giving us this report? Okay, Jimmy, you are. Uh, Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the city council. This is a ministerial request that the city clerk and and, uh, city staff bring to council to get approval to do two items. Uh, The first item is to continue the existing practice of the city of Gilroy to pay half of candidate statement cost. Uh, Those are the ballot statements that go on the actual uh, uh, document uh, to continue to pay half of those. That means the city pays half, the candidate pays half. Uh, For the next election in 2024, that amount for the total for the the statement is expected to be $4,650. Uh, so it does go up every year, uh, but the city's practice has always been for the city to pay half those costs. That's the first action. The second action is to adjust 
uh, adopt a resolution adjusting the voluntary campaign expenditure ceiling from $59,250 to $60,078. That is based on population, and it is, again, a previous practice that the Council has voted for voluntary campaign expenditures. Uh, I'd be, that completes my report. Uh, I'd also be happy to answer any questions, although Beth is, is far more qualified in a lot of these more technical areas than I am. So uh, we're here to help you. Thank you. Okay. Council members, any questions? I have a few, Mayor. Okay. Um, Council Member I'm, I'm just going to answer these. So, um, Beth, again, um, the, it states in there the, the deposit per tenant statement is 4650 right? Is this specific to Gilroy or is this a county? This is a county-wide amount. County-wide amount. Okay. And uh, I, I think Jimmy might have answered, but how much has the city historically spent on um, tenant statements in previous elections. Do we know that? No, I don't have that number right off, but I can get it back to you. Okay, because the financial impact part of the staff report um, makes no mention of the actual estimated cost, so i um, not sure why that wasn't included. In the the staff. estimated cost is going to be based on how many candidates we have for council and the mayor. Right. No, I, I understand that part, but, I mean, having an estimate of, like, previous elections of how many folks, because um, we don't know. Right, we, we won't know what the estimated cost is going to be. Correct. Okay. okay. Yeah, so in, in as you know, right. in the past, right, right. so it, if there are 10 candidates right. on the ballot, the city has always paid for half, for half of those who want to do ballot statements. This is for the ballot statement. Right. If you, you, don't have, you don't have to pay this right. to run. But, yeah, if you want to put a ballot statement in, the city has always covered half of that cost. Okay. And this is suggesting the same. Okay. okay, if there are no other questions from council members, I'm going to ask for public comment. No public comment. No public comment. Move okay. for approval. Motion, second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Council member Rocco? Yes. Council member Marks? Yes. Council member Armaderas? Yes. Council member Hilton? Aye. Council member Klein? Yes. Council member Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blankley? Yes. All right, that passes unanimously. 10.2. Evaluation and consideration of adjusting future mayor and city council member salaries in accordance with recent legislation changes under SB 329. Uh, Jimmy, are you doing this report too? Oh, Bryce is doing this report. Good Mayor Council. Um, so as mentioned, uh, this item is to consider a future um, update of council member and mayor compensation. So the compensation for Gilroy City Council and Mayor is determined by ordinance. Um, general law cities, however, the amount is regulated by state law, which is what SB 329 was aiming to adjust. Um, and so that bill uh, was recently increased the compensation maximums based on population for general law cities. Um, the two uh, statements of when the bill was adopted was uh, this was due to compensation not having been updated since 1984 and to help councils become more diverse as increased um, compensation can help individuals across different income levels receive sufficient income from their service uh, to help continue serving the public and supporting their families. So SB 329 allocates funding amounts based on population. So for Gilroy, uh, if Gilroy were to follow SB 329, that would be $1,600 per month uh, for council compensation. Um, in, the, in, the, in the SB 329, that portion of government code, uh, the mayor is considered part of the city council, so it, it doesn't separate out a differentiation. Um, there's further legislation uh, in the same code that identifies a separate amount that can be out, um, um, uh, established for the mayor. Uh, so the current, current compensation, the council members uh, make $984 per month, the mayor $1,476 per month. Uh, the 50% higher than council member is by policy adopted um, by ordinance. Uh, the law allows for general law cities to apply higher rates based on inflationary factors as outlined in the law, and those are contained inside your staff reports in the packet. Uh, Gilroy currently applies an inflationary rate on its own by ordinance, which is the San Francisco Bay Area CPI. I'm sorry, yeah, CPI. Staff is recommending for council to increase the current compensation rate for council members to match SB 329's rate. Staff feels that that's a, it's a, um, definitely a, a negotiated amount and is a fair amount uh, that's been established by the state. For mayoral compensation, uh, the state law allows general cities to add additional compensation on top of council pay limitations for a city's mayor. There's no regulation about how much that is to be, aside from the fact that it has to be adopted by ordinance. Uh, SB 329 does not have any provisions for mayoral compensation in the new legislation. Uh, staff reviewed uh, the other known city in uh, Santa Clara County to have made SB 329 adjustments in Santa Clara County, which is Morgan Hill. 
Uh, Morgan Hills Mayor uh, compensation was adjusted to reach $3,397 per month in total compensation. Gilroy being 31% larger in population, staff is recommending a proportionate amount, uh, a 31% higher amount of 4450 per month total. So that would be 1600 of council pay plus 2850 per month for mayoral additional compensation. Uh, there are alternatives to this. Uh, so for council compensation, council could uh, choose to not approve an increase and remain with the current inflationary adjustments by ordinance, or can also increase, uh, but to a lesser or greater degree, uh, an amount other than uh, provided for SB 329. Uh, for mayoral compensation, uh, council may choose to stay with the current policy of 50% higher than council members, resulting in 2,400 per month. We also choose to match the relative difference in compensation between Morgan Hills Mayor and Council members, which is 166% higher. This would result in an amount of 4,253 a month. Um, it is important that, that Morgan Hill did not change its ratio based on SB 329. That's a ratio they had before as well. Uh, the Council may also split the difference between the staff recommendation and the city's current 50% policy, saying the total compensation for $3,425 per month. And of course, Council may also set a different compensation level for the Mayor as well. So the fiscal impact uh, is $80,040 from the general fund annually. This is for the city's staff's recommendation. Other alternatives mentioned would lessen the fiscal impact to varying amounts. Now the next steps, once council provide any direction that it chooses, uh, an ordinance with any changes in compensation levels then be prepared by staff and returned back to council for adoption. Uh, the change would not take effect, though, until the next election in November of 2024. Uh, so the recommendation is for council to provide direction concerning updating the city council member and mayor compensation. And that completes the presentation. Happy to address any questions or comments. Okay. Uh, Bryce, can you, yeah, on this slide, can I just ask about the eight, that $80,040? Mm -hmm. That's the impact for all seven, for the changes for all seven? Correct. Using the highest, using staff's recommendation, which is the highest amount for the, of the potential options for the mayor? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. All right. So we have we do have questions. So I'm going to go to council member questions, and then I'm going to uh, I'll go one round with council, and then I'm going to go to the public, and then we can come back. Okay. All right. Uh, council member Bracco. Bryce, um, your report makes it sound like um, we need to do this because the state said to. When that's not exactly true, right. correct? Because we're a charter city, we could do this anytime we want. Correct. Yeah. So. That so we're not bound by the state whatsoever? No. Or what any other city does? No. Okay, thank you. No. Council Member Hilton. Um, I'll wait till after public comment, please. Uh, okay, Council Member Tovar. Thank you. Oh, my right. was up oh, me. Go ahead, right. oh okay, I'm sorry, Council Member Armadares. That's okay. Yeah. Um, what is the, the new impact would be eight, about 80,000. What's the current impact? The current impact? Or there like, at be... our current rates, what? How much of the general fund does that take? Uh, okay, first of all, the eighty thousand is in addition to the to the current. So, right, I think oh, that's it's what. In right, yeah, the eighty thousand is what this would take over what is current. It's not. It says total. Well, it's the eighty thousand is the impact annually. Yeah. So it's eighty thousand addition, but that that it's not a one time. That means it's not one time. That eighty thousand is an increase right. on top of that, and then the ordinance would take effect as well for CPI adjustments going forward. Okay. And so what's the what's the total impact as it is now? So what does it currently seven? cost for council members? Right. Sure. That's what you mean. Just one second. I'll pull it right up here. So it'd be approximately thirty thousand. Pardon? Uh, thirty thousand. Thirty thousand is how much are is how much is, would be current based on the seven of us collectively. <laughs> thirty thousand. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, sense. Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you. Um, can you can you explain to me how this uh, matter of adjusting compensation for elected officials uh, us here obviously got proposed in the first place, um, given that um, we're a charter city and we don't have to abide by the state law. Correct. So the, 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 it's the recognition of the increase that the state, so even though we, we are a charter city, I know that. I, but if you recognize that the compensation hadn't been adjusted for, for, the, for the other cities for, what, 20, 
20 plus years. And on top of that, that when that rate was increased, you're actually being paid less than that right now. And so the thought is, okay, if you're already being paid less, even under current structure, because it, it's because it's, right now, like the $984 per month, the level is 1,600 for general law cities currently. And so the thought is, okay, if the difference is that great, it's appropriate time to come forward and see if there's an interest of council to adjust that. Again, it is entirely up to the options of council. Um, it is you are charged. Right. Right. No, I, and I understand that. And I, so what I'm hearing, what you just said, is that you're in your office and said, you know what, our council deserves more pay, more compensation. Is that how this came about? Because it's I mean, more, this, it, this, I, I'm trying to understand yeah. that. I mean, because okay, I, I, Mr. Okay. Tovar, absolutely, yes, you deserve more pay. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I didn't sit in my office one day and say, you know, council. This came about due to this um, this Senate bill, right? And it has been proposed in cities that are general law cities, and the Santa Clara City Managers Group, groups like that, talk about how we can send certain legislation even to charter cities that may be of value to you. Right. Uh, we do not care if you get more money. There's, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not, we don't have a vested interest. But what we do have a vested interest in is giving you the same opportunities right. that folks in general law cities do, and they have the ability under this Senate bill to do this. And so we believe that if it is of interest to you, you have the ability to do it as well. If you don't, then you you don't have to. Thank you. Okay, just two quick questions, and then I have some more, but I'll wait to after public comment. So, just making sure. So we're looking at raising our compensation. For, for city council members from 984 to 1600 a month, correct? Correct. correct. That translates to a what, 62% increase? I, again, I wasn't a math major. Approximately. Okay. okay. Then when you look at the mayor's composition, compensation, and I, I might be wrong here, from 1476 currently to 4450 a month? Correct. So, again, I was trying to calculate this in my head when, uh, on my way here, so we're looking at a 201 percent increase well we're looking at whatever the council approves that's, that's no no i know no, yeah. no 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 but uh, no i i understand i understand yeah. that it's uh, about 300 percent <laughs> see i was wrong by 99 percent. but okay so um in the past the mayor has made roughly about 50 percent more than the council members right so right so 50 percent 50 percent excuse me 50 percent yes. so what I'm trying to understand here is why, and again, I know the mayor and everyone up here does a great job and represents our city, but why are we looking to pay the mayor three times what the council members did? Is that, am I incorrect in saying that? So I can, okay. the, I, the answer I can provide you is what we only have one city that has gone through this SB 329 process in the county. We know others are likely to do, and the one city was Morgan Hill. And this is the ratio that they used in their city. We right. used it as a baseline for you, as an example, and then took into consideration the math that they, they use for population. So right. that's how that number is derived. Again, it's up to the council to say that's not the philosophy we have, but this was just based simply on math. Right. No, and I understand that. And again, I, I commend every council member and the mayor up here for the work that they do because we all put a lot of work in here um, in, in what we do. But... Again, trying to understand, I, I know what the mayor does, obviously, but trying to understand what's kind of changed in her job description it, for us to say she deserves three times more than what we're getting, the rest of us. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think that's where this is going to okay. go. We haven't gotten okay. there yet. No, I'm just, we're I, okay. I, just, I just want yeah. a clarification so, here. So, I, Bryce, do you have something you want to say? Because otherwise I would like to respond to that because yeah. I've been obviously looking at this issue a lot. And so, yes, uh, Morgan Hill, just they now their uh, compensation – Council members are at 1,200, and the mayor is at 3,400, right. 3,397. Right. Okay, wow. so this was just this was just an effort right. to start somewhere by staff. I didn't write the staff report, but by staff to do something that was similar. Now, the whole premise behind SB 329, 329, right number, is that is the argument that. It, it, it is not, it is precluding or preclusive, whatever the word is, right. to people to run for office with the pay as low as it is. And we all know that so many people think we're paid already, right? And we're not. They think, they, they think we actually Starbucks. get money. 
right? I mean, and all we get is a stipend. And speaking for myself, who gets 50% more uh, than the rest of you, that it doesn't even cover my expenses, right. right, of being here. So this is, like Jimmy was saying, an effort for us to be able to address. If he didn't put this on the agenda, then you'd be asking, why didn't we bring this forward when other councils have done this? And right. they've done so. What you what we decide is the disparity between the council and the mayor is up to us. But I think we all want to be. Um, cognizant of the fact that you do want to encourage people to run for office, right? right? You, we would like to see more candidates than not. Right. My fear is that we not get to a level where the reason you're, that you're encouraging candidates to run for the wrong reason, because right. none of us here did this for the money, right. right? And so we want to make sure that we are sticking with that, but staying within reason, because there are an awful lot of things we have to attend and do that we pay out of pocket. Right. And, yep. and that shouldn't be. And someone right. like me who's self-employed right. or Al Pinheiro who was too, it's a huge toll on your own business. Right. You, you, it, this, it, it is. And so that, that part is true. No, and I and okay. thank you for that. So I'm going to end my, okay. with, with this here. So no, I thank you for that. I, I understand. And the reason why I asked about how this came up is I'll kind of share with you kind of my thinking is um, how we as a city can justify increasing $80,000 of additional impact to the general fund when we're fighting for more money for urgent public safety, uh, adequate fire um, protection, more police officers, SROs, all of that, um, which we've been told over and over and over again, we don't have money for it. So I can't justify it personally. Um, I agree, I think we deserve more. I mean, I, you know, we all work, we have everything, but I just, I'm gonna vote no because I can't justify us getting an increase when we can't, we don't have the funds for other things as fire, police, uh, urgent, urgent care, or whatever it may be. So that's just my stance. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, and that's fine as long as we're not discouraging people from running either. We have to be mindful of that bar, wherever that bar is. Okay, Councilmember Hilton, did you want to speak before public comment? Did you say after? After. after. Okay, so Councilmember Jerry, I'm gonna, okay. Thank yeah. you. So public comment. I see two. Is that right? That's okay. Terrence Fugazi and Ron Kirkish. <clears throat> Hi guys. Good evening. Um, I think it's uh, strange for this to come up in an election year. I don't know how it got on the agenda, but um, what you guys do is hard work, and it's volunteerism, in my opinion, and I love it. I love that for our city, and it should absolutely stay that way. Um, it actually says in the city documents that it's a salary, not a stipend, um, even though we think it's a stipend. And you can get uh, reimbursed for any other costs that you may have. But it is a burden, um, and it does require that you receive some kind of compensation. But this is, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. It doesn't have a good look. Um, and quite frankly, I don't think any of you up there need it, or I would need it, or anybody else would need this. It's not going to make a difference really in your lives uh, in terms of, you know, increasing this pay. Also, it should be known, in addition to the salary you get, you get a pretty good, uh, you know, health and benefits package along with that uh, to the amount of about $27,000 for some of the members. So that's, and, and it's deserved. Don't, you know, get me wrong. Um, in addition, if you do have another job that you don't want to take that, you can get that back in cash. So you can get another eight or nine or $10,000 uh, on top of the pay. Um, and that's okay. But uh, if you happen to be making, like some people on there, public uh, employees, which is public knowledge that Council Member Hilton makes $152,000, $265,000 in total income, plus another $19,000 from the city of Gilroy in the year 2022, I don't know that we need to increase that for anybody. Um, oh, good. I still got a lot of time because I'm talking fast. Good. Um, the, uh, you know, if we did want to have diversity of income for people up on the dais. There's another way to do that, and because, as Council Member uh, Bracco said, we are not bound to, uh, to SB 329 or anything else. We can make it up however we want. And if we believe that that is a concern, let's use a sliding scale. Let's say, hey, if you don't have a high income, we're going to give you 5,000 or 6,000 or 8,000. And guess what? If you happen to own a house that's a million five or have a big amount of income, you get zero. And I'd be good with that and make you know, make it be so you can bring these people in uh, if that's what you want, because we have the ability to do that. But, uh, you know, discussing pay <laughs> increases and, and all that in an election year, I don't know, I don't see that's very good, especially when we could use this money right now for public safety with another topic that happens to be coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Every other year is an election year, by the way. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Kirkish. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, 
I really don't have, you know, which way this goes doesn't matter to me. It's up to you guys. But one thing I think we need to consider is attendance. Mr. Hilton has missed almost a year's worth of meetings out of three, and yet we're going to increase his pay and benefits. I think we need to discuss that kind of behavior. Are we going to reward that kind of behavior with more income? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to council. I have council member Hilton. Thank you. First, mm -hmm. um, so I just want to be clear to you for the members of the public, this is for the future electeds, not current. Um, none of us own these seats. We have to campaign and get it if we want. Uh, this is a perfect, I think this is a perfect example of how we can use our local control to address the issue of stagnant compensation for members of our city council and future members of the city of this elected body. Our compensation schedule, which is long overdue for adjusting, has not kept up with inflation and requirements for this position. We have the option to adjust mayor and council member compensation to, a, to account for inflation and support diversity in our city council because increased compensation can help individuals from across income levels receive sufficient income for their service, along with various retirement and health care benefits that we receive. Um, another way to look at this is that these positions are paid ones. And like with any job, there are certain expectations required of them um, and certain expectations that, that the general public should require of us. Um, you know, I'll throw in one, one little last thing too. Another thing that we can make it a lot easier to get uh, some, some more diversity up here is to do district elections. That would be another one. Um, so I am in support of uh, staff's recommendation. All right, Council Member Armendaris. Thank you. Um, this, this really is a, a tough one. Um, we're a working class community, and um, too often we don't we don't have uh, we historically we haven't had um, uh, a diverse council. Oftentimes, it's folks who are uh, business owners. They're independently wealthy. They don't have to worry about somebody else firing them uh, if they uh, miss a day of work for a meeting or miss a few hours to attend a committee meeting and so on. And so um, I think having adequate pay um, or pay that keeps up with the inflation, I don't think it'll ever be a, an actual living wage here, um, encourages working people, you know, who more accurately reflect the people of our community and the majority of our residents. Um, it affords them an opportunity to be up here, to consider it, to think about it, and for it to be viable for their uh, you know, financially for them. It helps mitigate the costs of um, losing work time, benefits, et cetera, that, that you know, um, things that are really tied to uh, folks who are more working class and, and who are the majority of our community. So I'm, um, I'm torn on this one, but I think in terms of future council members, I would be more up to, to voting in favor of it. All right, council member Klein. Yeah, um, it is for my case, being a business owner, and you do count the cost no matter where you're coming from, uh, whether you work for someone or you work for yourself, there's there's a cost that goes with that. And and I can only speak for myself and how I've approached this to run for office <laughs> and how I've continued to go in this direction is there is a cost that you have to pay, and that's fine. There's the people that have preceded us have paid heavy cost, uh, a lot with their lives, more than just with uh, compensation. And so for me personally, at this moment, and I, and I like the idea as a budgetary item, if we're going to look at increasing that compensation, we should look at doing that in the, you know, in the budget cycle, which would be our next budget cycle. And for me right now, I just don't see it's appropriate or necessary, so I wouldn't even vote for this. So thanks. All right, um, Council Member Bracco. Yes, um, as long as I've been on the council, I've never viewed this as anything but a volunteer position. Um, I understand some; it, it, it may be tough on it, on them, uh, but I, I don't think anybody has ever run to be on the council because they thought they were going to make some money doing it. So I, I think we ought to just leave it alone. Thank you. All right, Council Member Tovar. Thank you. Again, kind of go back, and I, I do respect what the council members who are in favor of this, um, the reason behind that. But again, as I mentioned earlier, I can't justify when we are doing for 
nickels and dimes of trying to get more public safety or firefighters or whatever it may be, 80,000 is a, a big chunk of change. And I understand the work that we all put into it, but um, I think the priority should be that, um, not compensating us. I understand we need more diversity. I agree 100 percent, but it's a big number. And I just want clarification because in reading this, this bill, it says any council member currently serving office would be eligible for the increase compensation if it's enacted during their term. That means that if the adjustments were made while they were still in office, they would receive the revised salary. After the election. What it means is. No. Oh, I, I, oh go ahead. I can chime in. Um, I'll find it. It is a different code section and action and um, it isn't explained in the bill and it's under 36516.5. It says a change in compensation does not apply to a council member during the council member's term of office. And it says, um, so that is, it, it's, it's by virtue of the council member beginning a new term of office. So it's in a diff it's a little misleading because 329 only talks about 36516. 36, and if you, you have to look at it and it's the next pr section that right. says how it applies to the future council members. So um, oh. I had that question today, so I looked it well, up. So. Thank you for that, Julie. I told you I was going to have some questions for you. Thank you for that. <laughs> but again, just finally, again, and I understand, and again, I respect the work that we all, all do, but going back to my earlier comments about the adjustments of a council member and the mayor, um, I just don't see how that three times more than a council is going to make us a cohesive group knowing that someone gets three times more than the rest of us, right? What would you propose, council member? That we all, if, if you guys are moving forward with this, that it would be, I mean, everyone gets equal or, I mean, a small percent, five, ten percent addition for the mayor, but not that amount, right? Okay. I just cannot... I can't justify that, again, because I'm going to continue fighting for the other services that we need. So, Okay, so so right now the mm -hmm. mayor gets 50% more than right. council members. So I certainly would hope that we don't <laughs> make that, make that no. less because it is a lot of work. Okay, but what I would like to, to say, I, I think everybody else has been able to speak, is that I mean, none of us, like I said earlier, none of us up here right now did this for the money. And I certainly am not here because I need more money from the city of Gilroy to do this job. It isn't that. Um, but I do want to see us keeping up with what is reasonable in other cities and for people who might be considering running for office but not to the extent of this amount of money. I'm agreeing with you on there. So I haven't had a chance to say what I think we should be doing, so that's what I want to try to do right now, to try to uh, capture that, that, uh, you know, that, that point where people can still consider running, but where, and, and you're not going to make a living earning at this job at all. So I would like to propose that we up the council member salary from the 980 that it is right now to the 1600, which is based on population, and that the mayor, just like it is now, be 50% more. That would bring it to 2400, not 4450. And that would be an impact on the general fund of about $15,000, five. You guys did that. Ahead. So. You see, yeah, I just I asked you to do that right now because that's what I've what I've thought coming into this is what we should be doing, um, but that's up to the up to the council. I just think that from 980, basically a thousand to 1600, is not an unreasonable change for council members. And the mayor should just be what we've always done. We are a charter city. We do what we want. The 50 percent more, and then from there it. It increases like it does today, C CPI or COLA or whatever the, the heck it is, where it changes a little bit each time. Um, but that would be what I would suggest. And if um, I might even be. I think that sounds might, more reasonable, Mayor. Okay, so I'll go um, ahead and make a motion. I think it does too. Oh, I have a question. Okay. Does that sound more I have fair? Something. Well, again, well, wait, Council Member Marks has yeah, a question okay. first. Okay. Right. Well, it's not really a question, it's oh. a, a comment. Okay. Since we are a charter city, we basically can do what we want. Yes. And right now, three of us would not be included in this increase if you vote on it. As a charter city, I would like to say that everyone in January would get the same brace because we all do the same amount of work. Yeah, so... I'm fine with that. What do you mean? So am I. So, well, Rocco, Klein, and myself 
are not up for election this year. And so we would not get the raise. Mm. It's only the newly elected. So since we're a charter, I'd like to see it be equal amongst all of us. Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think we should talk to our city clerk who has looked at this as the, the raises. And okay. Think, go ahead, Beth. It would be effective after this coming election for every council member. Okay. So even those that oh. are staying on would still get the increase to okay. the new pay. All right. I thought Everybody would be okay. equal. Okay. I, I didn't understand that when Jolie read yeah. that. It sounded like just newly elected. But if you're terming out, it, it, when, yeah, we, you yeah. don't. If it passes now, it doesn't happen until after right. the next after it's the election. Right. Right. Yes. Like how okay. we changed the, the even and odd years Correct. and it went mm -hmm. to the next people. Correct. And the oh, only okay. limitation, I mean, right now, the only thing we have in the charter is reimbursement the members of the council shall receive reimbursement for expenses incurred while performing official business um, of the city and authorized by um, the council so that's the only thing that's in the charter that even touches on reimbursements mm -hmm. and salary so um, but it will okay. it will need an ordinance and i'm sure the clerk knows the um the ordinance has, it has a very, it's different than the rest of them. You have two public hearings on it. Correct. You have two, two reads and then it's adopted. It's, Correct. It's a little quirky, um, but um, if you go that route. That's correct. Okay, so, okay, Council Member Tovar. Thank you. So, uh, and I'll just end it with my last promise again. So, kind of when we talked, I, I agree, the diversity part of it, we all agree with that. And I think each and every one of us tries to do, do a good job in getting more folks to um, to run for office or for commissions or whatever it may be. This is my 20th year in office and I've never once looked at it as it's gonna be, I'm gonna make money here, right? I take time off, I'm the definition of a commuter, barely making it, whatever it may be. Um, and I understand going from 900 to 1600 is a good chunk of change, but um, I, again, I'm gonna vote no for this because I can't just justify yeah, I understand the new proposal, but still, it's money that we're taking away from something else. So. Okay. That's it. It's down to 15000 though. Okay. I just want you to know. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I heard that. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. We are all up here not for the money. I mean, we all ran and we, knowing full well. Okay. I would, I would like to ask before we... Wait, did I get a... Was there a second? Wait, did I say it was a motion? No. Okay. No, you didn't. Not okay. Me. Then, okay. Hang on. Uh, Jolie, is there any... I just want, because a member of the public brought it up, is there um, any kind of attendance thing that's at issue? I know some cities, um, they withhold pay if you don't attend meetings. Is that something we can address or no? Yeah, the city manager might want to weigh in. Um, it, it would have to be in your, it would have to be in the ordinance or in the norms. I don't see how you can do that. I know we can do it for appointees, but I'm not sure we can do it for electeds. Okay. Yeah, I would think that would be an administrative nightmare okay. um, to try to, especially because a lot of the absences, we do not share why that individual, because it may be health related or something. And so I, I would caution council to get into that kind of minutia about why somebody's not here. I just no. I, I do think that there are some charter cities that have it in their charters. Yeah. And they don't get their stipend if they don't attend. That, that's exactly where I was going. Kind of like the water district yes. people. That right, because it was raised. And, and there are exceptions if it is because you're ill or health stuff. But sometimes it is because of a conflict of something else you're doing, and that is why you're not attending. And so they do dock the stipend. But, okay, we're not going to go there. So the, I, I would like to make a motion that we go with staff's recommendation with the 1600 for everybody, and then a fifth, the 50 percent increase like we've always had for the mayor, which drops the fiscal impact to, uh, quite a bit, <laughs> okay. And still does not make this a living wage, but makes it something that can keep up a little more and hopefully will encourage uh, more people to consider doing this. So is there a second to that? I'll second. Okay. Then I guess from there we just need a vote. Councilmember Bracco? No. Councilmember Armendaris? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Yeah, aye. Councilmember Klein? No. Councilmember Tovar? No. Mayor Blankley? Yes. 
that passes that was four, to four to three. Four to three, right. Okay, and that has to come back now, right? It's, that's still going to. That's correct. We'll have to bring the ordinance back. Yeah. Okay. 10.3 Receive report and receive direction on CDBG program year 2024 25 funding allocations. A quick, do I need to recuse myself for this one? I have not checked in with Jolie. Because I, yeah, I think you board do. member. Yeah. Can you receive compensation? I don't, but I'm on the board. Yeah, I feel better with keeping myself. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so staff report is by Sharon. Yeah, yes. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and members of the community. Tonight we're going to present a report on CDBG and seek council direction on CDBG allocations for the next program year. For some quick background, CDBG is administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development of the uh, federal government. All CDBG funded activities must meet a national objective. The city of Gilroy has been using CDBG to benefit low and moderate income persons. Program year 24 to 25 will be a one year funding cycle because it is the fifth year and the final year of the city's 2020 to 25 consolidated plan. The consolidated plan identifies the community development housing needs for the city. CDBG funds must be used to implement priority needs and goals in our consolidated plan. For program year 24 to 25, we're estimating the HUD formula funding for Gilroy to be around 400,000. HUD sets a cap for some of the funding categories. Based on the approximate allocation of 400,000, the maximum funding for public services is capped at 15%, and that's 60,000. The maximum funding for program administration is capped at 20%. That will come out to 80,000. And this leaves 260,000 for non-public services. So if you look at the table um, on the screen, the first row kind of summarizes that annual allocation. In addition to the annual allocation, staff has identified over 106,000 of unused CDBG prior year resources that will also be included in this funding cycle. Same as last year, staff has been spending significant efforts assessing CDBG activities and also requiring funded entities to complete their projects from prior years. Through these efforts, we have identified unused prior year's resources where projects came in under budget. Know that these prior year's resources may not be allocated to public services because that cap limits the amount available for those type of activities. Therefore, in accordance with HUD regulations, the unused prior year's resources can only be committed to uh, non-public services. Including uh, prior year's resources that was not expended was, is going to allow uh, areas of larger community needs, such as affordable housing or rehabilitation or preservation work, uh, or safe pedestrian pathway creation. So those type of works uh, require larger funding. So using unused prior year's resources for that uh, can help those areas to be accomplished. So this table summarizes the estimated available funding and le eligible uses for that next program year. As you can see, public services were estimating 60000 um, for non-public service, over 366000 That's the combined total from the 260000 from annual allocation and the over $106,000 of the prior year resources. And then our program administration, that's capped at the $80,000. The city does receive a direct allocation of CDBG funding from HUD every year, and we're responsible for developing a process to disperse the funds to the community. To facilitate this process, we conduct public out outreach and release a notice of funding availability to um, for each funding cycle that allows all the interest parties to directly apply for these funds. So on the screen you can see this is a summary of our citizen participation committee outreach process to allocate CDBG resources. Um, rather than going through every bullet point, I think I'm you know, just going to summarize that staff has conducted extensive public outreach to community organizations through public notices, direct notification to applicants and nonprofits. We've done presentations, um, done website posting, social media posting, and also we do hard copies at the city hall and the library. 
So throughout the application materials and the public hearing presentation, we highlighted some application entry criteria uh, several times. As I described the application, application instructions, and through our presentation, first-time applicants or applicants with new projects were required to meet with city staff to discuss if their proposed project meets CDBG eligibility requirements prior to submitting their application. Throughout the process, we also emphasize that applications must meet national objective of benefiting low and moderate income persons. Applications must meet consolidated plan priority needs. Applicants must be nonprofit organizations, and applicants must have an audit or financial statements, which is a requirement of any agency receiving CDBG funds. By January, 6, um, January 16, which is our deadline for the applications, we received 15 applications total, and the funding request uh, total over $1.1 million. Over the past few months, staff has reviewed applications, conducted HUD research, and analyzed a variety of approaches and options to best proceed in getting these funds into the community. While CDBG funds may be used for a wide variety of activities, the city is limited to only utilizing 15% of the annual allocation that fall under the public service grant category. And this is the most requested application category every year. To facilitate our analysis, uh, staff is identifying applications as either public service for, or non-public service because of the funding restriction. Um, if you look at the staff report attachment, there's a table with a lot of data, and that table summarizes, summarizes each application's proposed activity um, and their requested funding. In the entire agenda packet, that will be page 42 of 51 and page 43 of 51. So um, if you want to look at those two tables, and I'm going to be going over kind of each of the funding categories. So first, we're going to look at the um, non-public service applications. We received a total of four applications with funding requests totaling uh, 790000 versus our estimated total of $336,645. Upon review and consultation with our HUD representative, staff has determined that there were two organizations that would not be eligible for funding. One of the applicants was uh, We Care. While microenterprise activities are eligible under the you know, entire CDBG funding, those activities were not identifying the city's consolidated pr plan priorities, which guide staff on what type of activities could be funded over the five-year period. Microenterprise activities don't meet any of the priority needs that was sought in our application packet or presented during our public hearing NOFA process. The applicant also didn't meet the city requirement of being a nonprofit organization. It is a for-profit organization. The applicant did not schedule the required new applicant meeting with city staff. They did not schedule the required appointment to discuss why they lacked an audit or financial statement with city staff. In addition, uh, in their application, they submit an authorization to request funds to the city of San Jose rather than Gilroy. So for these reasons, uh, this application was deemed ineligible and staff is not recommending that proposal. The second application um, that's deemed ineligible is from the Miller Red Barn. After we reviewed the project scope with our HUD representative, um, the HUD representative confirmed that the tenant of the property cannot apply for funding on the project. Staff is also unaware of any agreement that is in place between the owner, which is the city, and the tenant that gives the tenant legal authority to request funds on the city's behalf to perform construction activities. So as a result of that, um, two applications, remaining applications, they were eligible, and that's from the Public, public Works Department and Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley. As we mentioned before, uh, there's an estimated $260,000 from the approximate $400,000 of annual allocation. And prior year's resources, that's over 106000 that would be going toward non-public service. 
So out of the combined over $366,000, staff is proposing to fund them equally. And those are the numbers you see on the screen. For public works, for the sidewalk and curb ramp improvements, $183,323. And for rebuilding together Silicon Valley for their repair and accessibility modification program for low-income homeowners, that's $183,322. So next, we're going to look at the public service applications. And if you have those um, two pages pulled up, the two uh, tables, uh, then you can look at the top section, which is actually, I think, page 42. Um, that's entirely on the public service applications. Staff received a total of 11 public service applications with funding requests totaling over $348,000. And as we explained earlier, based on the $400,000 of annual allocation estimation, uh, that will limit the amount to only $60,000 available for public services. Um, staff completed a complete review of those applications and supporting documents, as well as the eligibility criteria based on the description in the applications. And during this review, staff determined that St. Joseph Family Center's Gilroy Street team would be not eligible to receive funding because it provides stipends to members. CDBG funds may not be used for income payments. Therefore, that uh, application was deemed ineligible and was removed from consideration. This leaves um, 10 applications eligible. Um, staff is proposing three approaches um, for council consideration. And the three approaches, if you look at page 42, there are kind of three columns toward the right. And we're applying the three approaches to the 10 eligible remaining applications. So the first approach we looked at was just the equal distribution. And that is to fund all public service applications equitably, equally with funds available. And the result is funding the 10, 10 remaining public service applications at $6,000 per application. Um, this dollar amount would not meet the city's minimum requirement, which is $7,500 per application. This minimum amount was established some time ago, and it was to consider the administration cost um, for these funds and also the funds available to provide the actual services. It was just you know, kind of a minimum amount. Otherwise, it would be just so small, the administration costs and the amount to provide services just would not be quite feasible. So therefore, this option, even though we considered it, um, it staff doesn't recommend it, and we did not do any further analysis besides the $6,000 per application. And the next approach or option that we looked at, uh, we just called it non-duplication. And what we're looking at is funding fair housing through program administration. That's another funding category. That's up to that 20% of the annual allocation. And then remove duplicative public service applications and the ones that did not meet the requirements of the NOFA. And the result of this is that we will be funding fair housing through program administration, remove the duplicate services, and fund seven public service applications equally. And the math turned out to $8,751.43. And I'm going to go through a, some more explanation and why this is staff's preferred uh, option and the staff recommendation for allocation. So HUD does allow fair housing services to be either funded under the public service category, which is the one that has the 15% cap, or program administration, which is the 20% cap. Um, to maximize the amount available for public services, Staff believes the program administration funds are better suited to fund fair housing activities. If we do fund fair housing out of public uh, program administration, that does mean we'll be reducing the amount available to fund staff time and consultant time. That means the general fund dollars would be impacted by the same amount. But as explained, uh, staff believes this provides more public services for the community. And that's why we considered this approach. Two of the applications requested funding for fair housing services. That's Project Sentinel and Colors. 
Parts and Sentinel has been providing the city's fair housing services. And in Santa Clara County, Parts and Sentinel provides fair housing services for Cupertino, Milpitas, Mountain View, Palo Alto, San Jose, Santa Clara, and Sunnyvale. Staff believes Project Sentinel is uh, the most qualified applicant to implement a fair housing program on the city's behalf. So under this scenario, uh, the Colorado's fair housing proposal will be removed from consideration because it's a duplicative service. Uh, additionally, um, Colorado's did not meet with staff prior to application submittal as required for a new proposal, and their application didn't have all the supporting documentations as well. And uh, two other applications proposed duplicative services. And those were homeless prevention services that focused on rental assistance to low-income households. St. Joseph Family Center and Carlos both proposed um, programs for these services. St. Joseph Family Center has been providing rental assistance to Gilroy residents. Staff believes it will be more efficient to fund only one of the programs so that they don't offer a duplicative service. Also, it will remove the risk of funding the applicant twice should they apply to both agencies for assistance and possibly creating a duplication of benefits, benefits which goes against HUD regulations. As with the fair housing applications, Colorado did not meet with staff prior to application submittal for a new program, and their application uh, did not have all the supporting documentation that the NOFA requires. Therefore, staff recommends removing the application for the funding pool. So based on this analysis, we will be removing uh, three applications, that is to fund fair housing uh, for projects and under program administration. So we're removing from the public service category and then removing the two colorist applications I just talked about. So with the um, remaining seven applications, if we divide $60,000 equally, that comes out to the $8,751.43. And while this is a small allocation, it does meet the city's minimum 7,500 per application. And this option does provide funds to meet a variety of needs um, in the community, so that's why staff recommends this option. And you know, as you can see, these, these approaches are really kind of pretty high level, because uh, you know, when it comes down to the math, yes, you know, it's up to council if you want to refine this further, but we're trying to kind of just provide council three high level approaches. And then the third approach we looked at was what we call an evaluation-based option. This is to keep the same parameters um, as we did for the non-duplication option, but only fund the public service application that had the highest evaluations. And the result of that is to fund fair housing through program administration, similar to the prior option we talked about, and then fund two public service applications that's um, scored the highest. That's $40,000 for South County Compassion Center and $20,000 for the Health Trust. And so I want to explain a little background about this. Um, so under this scenario, staff is still looking at the seven public service applications. But we're looking, you know, we are adding the evaluation methodology that staff has utilized in prior years. So staff looked at the evaluation criteria that were provided in the application and that was distributed to the applicants in the NOFA process and focused the limited dollars available on the applications that rated the highest based on the evaluation criteria. And um, the assessment focused on quantitative criteria rather than qualitative efforts. So for example, uh, under one of the criteria, proposed beneficiaries with the lowest targeted income levels, that's one of the criteria, a value was given based on who the applicant stated they would primarily be serving with the funds, with the lowest income group receiving the highest valuations. And that's why um, the Compassion Center, since they were serving unhoused, they received higher valuations based on this criteria. All the assessments all came out very close, and staff acknowledges how important all of the services are for our community and how deserving all the applicants are for the funds. And based on this methodology, um, staff are recommending the funding the top two applications. This option prioritizes applications with the highest evaluations 
and provides them with the most financial assist- assistance in hopes of allowing their agencies to operate to the um, these programs to operate to the greatest extent. In this scenario, uh, the two applications, as I mentioned, South County Compassion Center and the Health Trust, the forty thousand and twenty thousand actually happened to be their applied, their requested amount, and just happened to um, add up add up to our assumed annual allocation of you know, 40000 and at the 15%, which is 60000 So next, I'm going to move into the program administration funding category. And that's on page 43 uh, at the bottom section below non-public service, if you're looking at the table. HUD allows, oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is just the summary of the non-duplication option. That you, If you're looking at page 42, that's that column that's literally under that heading of non-duplication option. And it's listing the applicant and their program and the amount. Okay. Um, so now onto the program initiation category. As we mentioned, HUD allows up to 20% of the, of the annual allocation for program administration, which is staff time and consultant time for administering and managing the CDBG program. With the estimated $80,000 for program administration, um, under the first approach, which is the equal distribution, that one is not funding fair housing out of pub, uh, program administration. And therefore, that's just staying, you know, the entire $80,000 for program administration for staff time. Under non-duplication option and evaluation-based option, that's where we have proposed to fund fair housing out of the program administration. Uh, and we have recommended Project Sentinel to be funded. Their requested amount is $22,000 and uh, $22,061 for fair housing services. And that leaves $57,939 for staff time for administering CDBG program. So that's just how the kind of math worked out. So um, here's our next steps. As you saw, because we have a very limited funding available based on our estimation and there's significantly higher applicant request, uh, staff is you know, proposing the three approaches to seek council direction and input on the final activities to be included. Staff recommends that council receive the report and direct staff to proceed with a non-duplication option or an alternative option that's proposed by council. And upon direction by the city council, staff will update the draft annual action plan, which includes these funding recommendations. And when the actual amount is released by HUD for our annual allocation, uh, staff will adjust the proposed allocation for each application proportionally to align with council direction. And we'll also incorporate those adjustments into the annual action plan. And uh, on May 6th, staff will return to council for council to consider approval and adoption of the annual action plan prior to staff submitting it to HUD. So staff's recommendations for council to receive the report and provide direction on the CDBG funding allocations for program year 24-25. And I also want to just recognize um, Sandra Nava for the significant efforts that she has put into CDBG program all these years. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Sandra. Okay, um, council, council member Tovar, I see that you have your hand raised. We have three members of the public who would like to speak too. Do you, is it okay if I go to the public first? Of course. Okay, so Sharon, I'm going to ask for public comment next. So I see Ann Peterson, Linda Phillips, and Deanne, is it, Everton? Okay, so starting with uh, Ann, you can come to the podium here, and um, three, everybody has three minutes. Uh, good evening, council members and mayor. Uh, I'm Ann Peterson. I'm the um, outgoing executive director at Live Oak Adult Day Services. Uh, the incoming executive director, Heather Moore, is here with me, too. Um, we want to thank you for many, many years of CDBG funding and support. Um, we've been in the um, Gilroy area for over 30 years at this point. Um, as you probably know, we are um, an adult day center for seniors who have um, mild to moderate 
cognitive impairment. We provide a day program for them, food, uh, lunch, breakfast, activities that enrich their lives, uh, provide socialization. Um, in the same, the same time, we're providing respite for their caregivers, um, respite so that they can take a break, so that they can go to work if they need to, all those kinds of things. Um, we're advocating for you to um, fund more than just two public service um, agencies. Uh, we'd love to um, receive funds from you again this year. Um, it helps us immensely to serve our seniors, your seniors in Gilroy, and um, it helps us to leverage our funds so that we can show other folks that you know we are well respected in the community. Um, just a report from last year, uh, we served so far, we're doing three quarters and we've served um, 2,370 meals throughout the year. We've served 15 of the 20 people that we are slotted for, that sounds about on track. And we have uh, served, uh, we've been open for 173 days, that's three, 173 days of activities for folks. Um, we're going to cut back. We probably won't make that number this year because there was uh, major flooding and pipes and stuff that needed to be done, needed to be fixed. So we had to close. But in general, the program is um, hugely effective. The seniors only want to come to our program. It's not like uh, it's, it's just a joyful, fun place for everybody. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Linda Phillips and then Deanne. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Linda Phillips, and I am the Director of Community Development at SourceWise. We are a nonprofit organization and the Area Agency on Aging to Santa Clara County. For 51 years, we have served older adults, persons with disabilities, and their caregivers in Santa Clara County. We offer 17 direct programs and served over 100,000 individuals last year alone. We know transportation is a vital part in maintaining older adults in the community and in their homes for as long as possible. One of the largest barriers to health care access is safe, affordable transportation. I'm here to kindly request your support of our South County Transit Service, which has been providing free transit services to residents in the cities of Gilroy, Morgan Hill, and San Martin since 2017. Our program is the only free transportation option to Gilroy residents who are older adults over the age of 60 and, with, and persons with disabilities over the age of 18. Funding will serve 56 residents, providing 1,635 one-way rides to non-emergency doctor appointments, dental appointments, pharmacies for prescription drug pickup, grocery stores, and the Gilroy Senior Center. Clients that we serve are 70% female, 70% have a disability, 62% are at or below 100% of the federal poverty line, meaning all are extremely low income. Older adults who are in need of additional supportive services are also connected to our case management services, as well as our information and awareness department, which provides assistance and access to a network of over 800 community-based resources to meet their individual needs. We hope you'll support our efforts to provide free transportation to older adults and persons with dis disabilities. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Okay, Deanne. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Deanne Everton. I'm the Executive Director of Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley. Thank you to the City of Gilroy for supporting the work of Rebuilding Together to fund critical home repairs and safety modifications from, for some of our community's most vulnerable. In fact, 138 households in total have been served in Gilroy uh, today with an income today of 37,000 most below 30% of the area median income. Um, these are older adults and people with disabilities making tough choices every day between food and medicine and overdue home repairs and safety modifications. We know that the condition of our home has a direct impact on the health of its residents. Health is so greatly impacted by the condition of a home that every $1 spent on urgent home repairs can save $19 in Medicare and Medicaid costs. So not only do the repairs we make 
at no cost to the recipient, make, uh, make those tough daily choices a little easier, but they also generate a social value for the homeowners, their families, their caregivers, the health care system, and taxpayers that far surpass the cost of the repair. It is proven that home preservation is the best and most affordable housing option for many low-income households, costing about 26 times more to build a new affordable housing unit than to repair an existing one. Additionally, when a low-income home is renovated, the property value increases, which benefits the entire neighborhood. The work of rebuilding together Silicon Valley preserves our current housing stock revitalizes our neighborhoods, all for a relatively low investment, while at the same time saving our community costs that far again surpass the cost of the repairs. This year, we were awarded $285, I'm sorry, $258,000 in CDB fun, CDBG funds, and we are well on our way to meeting our goals of assisting 22 families with critical home repair needs. We are very grateful for the staff's recommendation of $183,000 for 24-25. We respectfully request your consideration this coming year um, in our request of our requested amount of $268,000, a small increase, to account for inflation and the rising cost of materials and labor so that we can continue our partnership at the same level to preserve affordable housing in Gilroy and restore hope for so many of our neighbors in need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, does that conclude public comment? Yes, yes. Okay, so to council, council member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to the uh, individuals that spoke up and uh, for the service that you provide to our community. So, um, you know, I, I commend you for that work. Sharon, um, and my questions are not questioning, obviously, the organization, because I know each and every one of them does great stuff that's needed, but I appreciate you holding people accountable with the application, making sure. Um, you know, one of the things, over and over, every time we have this discussion, I'm, I'm always asking about accountability, right? Uh, can you tell me how the city tracks the funding that's allocated to these organizations and then how it's actually used? I understand reading the, but I, I want to know how we, you know, from what we, they tell us, how do we know what it's actually being used for? Is there a tracking reporting system? What do we use to make sure that we're, they're actually using the funds for what they say they're using them? Yes, with federal funding, especially CDBG, there is a lot, a lot of monitoring and tracking. And that's where, you know, Sandra has been sp spent a lot of significant efforts all these years. We get quarterly reports from the organizations, and there's also annual reports that we have to file with HUD. Okay. And it's a lot of documentation because HUD can do an audit, audit at any time. Right. So that's why we will emphasize a lot of you know, documentation with all the nonprofit organizations. And that's the reason when we did not get all the supporting documentations, mm -hmm. you know, we felt that was a really important requirement. Uh, and the reason behind those documentation too, like for example, why HUD requires an audit or financial statement is they want to make sure organizations have a system in place, right. you know, to, to uh, have an accounting system accounting system in place and financial system in place that they will be able to um, track the funds and use them accordingly and that's why yes good and i, and I appreciate that because again i think all of us here we want to make sure whatever funding we give and i know the work has been done but we have to hold you know we're we're being held accountable for the money that we're giving out right and i just want to make sure that we know exactly the money that we're providing is intended for obviously the use of what folks are doing because i think if we start yeah, I think in the past we didn't have this much accountability, so I was always concerned about well, what's the funds being used for, right? So I appreciate the work that you're doing. I appreciate the work that you're all doing here, and I'm glad to hear that we have something in place. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other council members on my board here. Is there anyone who has a comment? Okay, we're, we're here to give direction to staff. Um, speaking for myself, I would support uh, the non-duplication option, but that is what we are here to decide so that staff knows does anyone have a different uh, suggestion otherwise that would be the one good okay enough direction yes thank okay. you very much all right thank very you good that then brings us to 10.4 consideration of a potential public safety sales tax ballot measure for the november 5th 2024 election Ballot, election ballot.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is a, uh, a follow-up discussion that uh, staff is having with you tonight uh, from when we, uh, we tried to identify funding for enhanced public safety services, uh, some of the more difficult conversations that I know Council's had over the last few months, but this was one of the options that we had for you to try to, try to improve and, and in some ways maintain our service levels. Uh, very key tonight, we're not asking for any decisions. We're not asking for uh, any, uh, you know, a lot of deliberation. What we are asking for is for you to see the first concept and then to give us the feedback so we can show you what we can do with it and what process we'll have with the community as well and, and trying to see if this is a viable option for uh, the city of Gilroy. Um, as I mentioned, staffing for all city departments, and not even including non-public safety, has been a challenge, and we have not returned to pre-pandemic levels. Although I will say we've all worked very hard in the last couple of years over the budgets to add staffing back. We, we have been able to grow our staff back close. Uh, we have not done it at a proportional amount of our population growth or our housing growth, and so our community is continuing to want more services from us, and it's very difficult to provide. Uh, we have studies going back 10 years ago for both police and fire, uh, basically stating that we need additional staff to sustain current service levels. Uh, we did reach out to some of these companies that had done it before and asked them if they'd be willing to update it, and they said, well, we can, but we're just going to tell you you still need more staffing. So uh, we didn't really think we needed to go to a, a, a really extensive study to prove to you that we need more staffing. Uh, we all know that public safety is a crucial pillar for our community. It is always in one of the council's priorities and goals uh, to, to increase public safety presence, items like that. And it is, just with any other city that you, uh, you know of, it is the largest expenditure. Uh, the general fund is the only way, typically, that police and fire get uh, funded. And it is one of the few funds which the council has discretion on how to uh, allocate. So you can allocate it to recreation, you can allocate it to uh, other programs, uh, social services, et cetera. But at the end of the day, a majority of your money that you have an option to spend goes to public safety. And all those rest of the departments are kind of trying to, trying to figure out how they fund their programs that are also important, but uh, sometimes aren't as high up on the priority list as public safety. Uh, Sustaining services requires significant general fund investment. The police and fire departments take up about 64% of the city's general fund budget. And so to give you the real numbers, almost $47 million out of, uh, out of $73 million. So again, you, you know this. Everybody knows this. Uh, but the service demand continues to increase. And I want to point out, it's not just the call volume. You, you have the ability to say call volume is going up or down. But what you, everybody has to realize is that a call that used to take 15 minutes may take an hour or two now. And as we've had issues with our ambulance service that Chief Wyatt's been talking about, uh, we're losing uh, firefighters for a couple of hours driving uh, you know, patients to places that the ambulance company should be driving them to. So it, the whole system is strained, and it's not, not just a numerical evaluation. It is a, is a practical level of service, uh, especially for mental health cases, things like that. So um, we've talked with council previously about reallocating funds from other department programs, but that does impact service levels to a lot of the services that you know, our community needs. And so if you continue to or you think about reducing uh, you know, funding in one program or one department, you, you will have a, the potential to really impact and eliminate that service. So it, it's a tough one. And so this is the direction that we've gone into to try to, to, try to give you an option. Uh, we have done some analysis about what we're looking at for uh, increase in public safety um, staffing. On the left side, you know, we just don't need fire or police officers. We also need uh, dispatchers. We need records workers. This is, they're all public safety, even if they're not sworn. And you're looking at about, uh, you know, 15 additional police staff, staff members. If you look at the fire side, which we've already talked about, we need to get up to about 45 if we want to be able to handle absences and, and some of the, the, uh, the um, issues we're having, you're probably going to need another, you know, 17 additional firefighters. You, you don't have an opportunity to get that out of your budget. It's just not practical. And so we need a way to uh, fund this. And uh, so the, these positions are just an idea of what you, you may be needing in the near future uh, to keep up with your population. Um, 
one thing that we have not, we've talked a lot about the fourth fire station, but one thing we kind of want to keep you one step ahead. We've talked about the fifth fire station, but actually we should be talking about the fifth fire company. Uh, we will eventually need to add a fire company to assist on the east side of town across from the highway as more and more industrial buildings are out there and who knows what is going to eventually be built out there. So that's not necessarily a fire station, but it is a whole nother engine. It is a whole nother, uh, you know, uh, minimum amount of staffing that we will need and so that's included in kind of the discussion we, we plan to have with the community is that we're not just talking about the fourth fire station I think that's something we will eventually solve but even beyond that is, is going to be a challenge uh, anytime you add staff you need vehicles you need equipment and so there are one time and ongoing cost as, as councils approved several uh, fire engines over the last couple of years several police vehicles uh, it, they're just very expensive and it's very difficult to pull them out of the general fund when you have so many competing interests. So we as staff are recommending that the city council consider uh, for the ballot a public safety dedicated sales tax. And so this is the, the, the framework that we're going to show you tonight. We want to get your feedback, want to get what you believe uh, you know, is best. And this would go on the ballot as part of the general election and it would be a special tax. So uh, uh, it would give us a dedicated funding source uh, just for public safety. Hires needed positions and procures critical infrastructure and equipment. And then there's no more competition with other departments for funding. Uh, so we wouldn't be pulling from these other departments anymore. We'd have this pot of money annually to, um, to utilize. Sales tax is rec recommended because it is our largest revenue source. But we have kind of some rough figures that sales tax is paid about half by those who don't even live in Gilroy. So you, uh, you would soften the burden, even though they do use these services when they come into our town, uh, the capture of non-residential shopper transactions because of Costco and, and the outlets in those areas. Uh, you would be able to uh, kind of split that cost with those who live here and those who do not. Uh, the sales tax right now is uh, only the amount is about Quarter, quarter cent available because of the legislation that limits the amount of sales tax you can charge. Uh, you can get a legislative exemption, but this is what is within your control right now. And so for, uh, you know, a 0.25% rate would generate about 4.1 to 4.7 million. And so for looking at what you can do with that money, we used a 4.5 million as the estimate for, for this report. The other thing that we've seen uh, be quite successful, and I have experience with this from the library bond uh, oversight committee, is having an oversight committee of, of residents who can look at what you're doing, look at the numbers, ask questions, uh, uh, same way that the OGO does for public records requests. And these are always the types of things that voters seem to appreciate. They seem to they, they like to have the opportunity to have someone who's reporting back to the council independently and did the city really spend the money in the way that the voters said they wanted you to. So uh, we would advocate for that. Um, it ensures compliance, shows that we're being transparent and we're showing that we're not, because usually the fear is, oh, the city's just going to spend it on other things. Well, the, the ballot measure wouldn't allow you to do that and the oversight committee could report out uh, independently that we are complying. So we, we looked at how do you allocate this money? Uh, it is not much fun to pay money for infrastructure projects, but it's something we cannot ignore. We have two fire stations that need seismic retrofits. Uh, we are looking to build a fourth fire station, uh, which will need significant equipment. So we have two options, and, and I'll tell you the difference between the two is the preferred option is staff would recommend that 25% of the sales tax revenue goes to infrastructure. Seismic upgrades, uh, you know, large equipment, things like that, and then 40% goes to police staffing and 35% goes to fire staffing. Now, this one is, is different than the right because the right is based on what is actually coming out of the budget currently. Currently, out of the general fund, 55% of that general fund money goes to police and 25 goes to fire. We don't recommend using that proportion because the police department has a newer building. They, ha they are secure for quite a while. Uh, we would look at perhaps a police substation down the road, but we have more pressing needs infrastructure-wise for fire and equipment than we probably do for police. So we're, we're advocating a split like this on the preferred option. It is not a direct proportional amount, but when we look at the budget and we look at the needs, uh, it's pretty close. Uh, the other thing that it allows us to do is this tax we could bond. We could issue bonds related to this tax. So let's say we need to, let's say we need $10 million in uh, funding to 
do uh, seismic retrogrades to all of our fire stations and facilities, we would be able to use this sales tax to go out and issue a bond and get that money immediately. We could make debt service payments annually uh, with the sales tax, and so that's a good way to get money quickly and, and get these projects done. Uh, we also recommend establishing what's called a general fund baseline. So we, what we want to make sure that the voters understand is that we're not we're going to set we're going to let you know exactly what we're spending right now on public safety, and we're going to cap that. So that way, we wouldn't be offsetting any of that with the sales tax that comes in. Uh, you would only be enhancing services, and so it would augment, not replace public safety funding. That seems to resonate with voters. They don't they, they want to make sure they're getting something for their additional taxes. And then it preserves the core public safety funding. So right now we're spending, I think I said, 66%. Uh, we would have some kind of mechanism to ensure that we, we don't start dropping that down uh, under certain circumstances. And so we would recommend a baseline when the ballot measure is considered by council for approval. So if council uh, provides direction tonight to proceed, uh, Again, we would begin uh, with our outreach uh, pretty much immediately and beginning uh, with uh, community meetings about potential ballot measure. Uh, we would uh, bring that back in July for council consideration of placing the measure. So we would take the feedback we received from you tonight, the public feedback that we receive, bring that all back in July, and then um, get your approval to submit documents, arguments, and any rebuttals to the register of voters, registrar of voters in August of 2024. The election in November 2024, results certified in December, and then at that point we have to work with the California uh, Department of Taxation uh, in getting that on to the sales tax uh, system in your way. So wherever you go and you buy something, it, it would include that tax, and then we get it remitted from them. Uh, the earliest date that that sales tax would start generating revenue would be April of 2025, so about a year from now. Uh, for full transparency, uh, putting things on the ballot are not cheap. Uh, we do know that. And so right now we're, we're hearing from the Registrar of Voters that it's going to cost us about $100,000 to put it on the ballot. That cost could go down if other cities and entities add ballot measures, as we'll all be able to spread the, um, the uh, administrative costs. But you should know that that is, that is our cost. And then the CDTFA will charge us probably about $175,000 to administer it. Uh, to uh, you know, get it on the uh, on the tax rolls for all the businesses in town and such, and then there was some other associated cost uh, with with this as well, which could be some legal review, could be uh, you know other impacts there. So next steps is if directed to continue, uh, staff will return July 29th to council with a finalized proposal for public safety sales tax measure for council to approve to place on the ballot. Um, our recommendation tonight, I'm just repeating it. Council direction to develop a public safety sales tax ballot measure and return to the return the proposed ballot measure to the city council for consideration and final approval for the 2024 general election. That concludes my report. Uh, there were many of us who contributed this, so I'll do my best to answer the questions that I can. But I'll I may look to some help. Um, to whatever right. is on your on your mind. Thank, Thank you. you, Jimmy. Yes, we do have some council member questions, and we have two members of the public who want to speak, so I'm going to start with council first. Again, everybody one round, and then I'll go to public comment. Council member Armendariz. Thank you, member, uh, mayor, and thank you, um, Jimmy and staff, for the report. Um, my question is uh, regarding um, outreach and support. Can the council take a formal position on supporting this ballot measure? Uh, yes, they can. Uh, it, it, in fact, putting it on the, um, the, the the putting it on the ballot is completely separate. You can actually put it on the ballot but not support it, and I have seen that before because yeah. people just want the voters. But the council can, in their status as elected officials, take a, 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 a take a um, position on a ballot measure as individuals, but as yes. a council as well. You could make that decision to do that. Okay, and then uh, follow up. Could we? Um, who would? Who would coordinate the efforts, um, the supportive efforts to get that passed? Do is it proper to hire like a consultant, or do we do that in house, or so, do we have the option? So we, as soon as the city has decided that it wants to put this measure on the ballot, we are kind of separating ourselves from the process at that point. So that's where the elected officials are great because they don't have the same rules that we as city staff. You, you're politicians. You can politicize this. You can you can generate. But uh, we as staff would then only provide information. 
Uh, we are allowed to do that, but it has to be very neutral and very fact-based. Uh, so uh, we, you know, we won't be out there looking for people to vote for it, but that's certainly a job we will look to our effect. That includes writing the statements for the, um, for the uh, ballot. Uh, the the argument the argu argument yeah. and that would be done by like, I think I believe the city attorney mm -hmm. uh, with the approval of the council okay yeah the Thank city you. attorney would do the impartial analysis and then if the council wants to do a um, in favor of argument then they can sign on for that too but once it's once it's decided that it's going on the ballot um, the, the city staff has to as Jimmy said step back no public money is used in support or for or against, no computers, no telephone, no advocating, no no public money. Mm -hmm. Up until it's on the ballot measure, and even when it's on the ballot, you can, there is an opportunity to educate the public. But we can't take, you know, we can't put stuff on our website, vote for, because that's using public forms. And I know Beth probably knows a lot about all the that stuff too but I um, mean we have to be very careful mm -hmm. no public money and there's all sorts of rules about you know who can campaign in uniform and not and so you have to be very careful thank you okay councilmember tovar thank you mayor and jimmy and staff thank you for this report um i fully support it um question jimmy um and it kind of in line with uh councilmember Armadera's this question do we, is there an oversight committee that's established where council members are involved, or is, once we decide what direction, kind of out of our hands? Uh, typically, oversight committees are appointees okay. from the council, but not council members, because council members are ultimately responsible for, as you, as you said, the right. accountability. Good. Awesome. Thank you. And then uh, remind me, is this a uh, majority or two-thirds vote? It pass? would be a two-thirds vote. Two-thirds vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I have several questions actually, so <laughs> here I go. Okay, so on the oversight committee, would the more would, would the details of what that what that would be come to us at the July 29th meeting? That is correct. Okay. And would that what's the duration of that committee? Forever? I mean, <laughs> It, well, it, if you have a ballot measure that does not have a termination date, you would have an oversight committee that does not have a termination date as well. Okay, and so again, when it comes back on the 29th, you will let us know how many people suggest on it, what their terms are, and that sort of thing. We'll do some, um, we're trying to copy what other cities have done that have been successful, uh, because we know they, they resonated with the voters, and so we would look to those cities and come up with a recommendation. Okay. Likewise. Okay. On the whatever slide it was where you said the quarter percent tax would be between 4.1 and 4.7 million, on the low end, the 4.1, is how did you arrive at that number based on like where we are today? Because our sales tax, our total sales tax revenue is dropping. So is this considering that or no? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Bryce to help okay. you with that. Okay, okay, thanks. Yes, Mayor Council. So um, our finance department worked with our sales tax consultant to look at both present and projected uh, as far as like in the near term, obviously, you know, the next couple of years out. But that's uh, something that they worked on together to come up with that number. Okay. So you're saying they came up with the low end or, or they, the range. they, they came considered the, range. the fact that our sales taxes are like what they are today. Correct. Which is a lot lower. I mean, we dropped a million dollars just in a quarter, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you on that one. Um, this may just be my misunderstanding from a conversation earlier today, but in in the staff report that that recommends 25% infrastructure, 40% police, 35% fire, I, I thought I heard you say at the podium, Jimmy, that the 40% and the 35% are just for staffing, but that's not the case, right? They are for staffing and staffing-related needs. Okay. So the infrastructure, and we can clarify this, is the infrastructure would be the bonded amount. You're not going to be able to bond a purchase of a new ladder truck. Mm -hmm. That would be coming out of the money that you have in each of those departments. Uh, in the other two, right. Yes. Okay. So it's primarily for staffing, but it does include some other things. The infrastructure is limited to like the seismic retrofitting, that sort of thing for the two fire stations. Yes. Okay. Um, on the slide where you had costs for the ballot of 100000 um, what was the 175000 
that is what the state of California charges us to implement that sales tax. So is it a one-time thing? It is a one-time thing. And is it because it's a sales tax? Like if this were a bond, would we not have that? You would have different fees, but not from the state of California uh, it, at this level. Uh, so basically what the state has to do is they have to notify all businesses. They have to administer it, get the systems in place, and then they have to uh, get things in place to allocate the money to us, and that's their charge for that. Okay. Uh, for bonds, you would pay a small fee, very small fee to the state to register these bonds, but not near the 175. Okay, but it's one time. Yes. And the cost for the ballot, gosh, I, I thought when I first got on the council, it was 30000 if you did it in an mm -hmm. election year. It's 100000 yep. That's what you... We're hearing from the ROV. Yes. <laughs> and, I mean, the good... Well, we're, we're not planning to spend money on polling, right? That is not on the table okay. for us right now. So, right. So, I mean, I guess we are always, we, we could, but that's what we did. I mean, that money, we, there was money spent by the, for the 2014 right. Measure F. Right. It was spent again in 2016 to try to see if it would pass then. So at least if, if we're not spending on the polling, if, if we are just going to go straight to the ballot, it at least saves that right. money that can go towards the, the ballot cost. Mayor, I don't want to interrupt you, but do you mind if I ask a follow-up question to what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, I yeah. don't at all. And, in fact, yeah. now is the great time to okay. do it because I think I'm done. Yeah, and Jimmy, going off what the mayor is saying, Correct me if I'm wrong. Again, I'm looking at, obviously, we need uh, two-thirds vote here, but is Davlin College also going out for a bond this year? I, yeah. um, I, I, I asked that question, guys. Yeah, no. if, you're now, if it's true, you have two, you know. Well, that, that <laughs> we have those discussions, and there are going to be numerous bond measures uh, in the next few years. We do know that Gavilon, in our discussions with uh, – Dr. Um, Avila. 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 Right. And we also know that the school district is talking about another one. But this is a sales tax. Right. And so we don't expect another sales tax from or a kind of tax from right. anybody because the, they can't do that. But we would be more concerned about the Civic Center Master Plan, yeah. which is going to be a significant bond issuance. We look right. for 2026. And we would love to not go at the same time as the right. school district and the, and the community college yeah. district. Yeah. But uh, we'll have to cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah. Well, Dr. Thank Avila assures us that his is going in 2024. Okay. So if we're yeah. ready in 2026 for a civic okay. center, we're, we're okay. Got it. What GUSD does, I don't right. know. But, you know, they just bought two new schools. Yeah. <laughs> we need a shot at this. You know. Yeah. Oh, thank you for allowing me to ask that question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I go to the public or do you That's have fine. a Okay. Okay. So I see three speakers. Is that right? Okay, Terrence Fugazi, Andrew Lopez, Ron Kirkish. Hi, guys. Okay. Up again, once again, um, kind of upset as a, like, 10 or 11-year citizen that this seems to be, like, a big surprise now. We just went through a budgeting process not but a year ago. Um, it, you know, even with people I asked individually, some on the dais there, and also Chief Espinoza, how was funding and are we staffed enough for public safety? And there didn't seem to be a whole lot of concern uh, during our budgeting process. And in fact, uh, you know, there was a promotion of a lot of uh, new positions uh, for the city that take precious resources. Um, you know, a year forward, now we're in a crisis, it seems like, that we're like rushing to get this on the ballot. Uh, you know, I want public safety just as much as the next person. I just don't know how it's possible that we get to this particular point right now and we haven't thought about it before and mentioned it even in a big budgeting process that we all went through. Um, and then we submit a proposal that doesn't have a serious alternative at all for belt tightening or hiring freezes or eliminating some of the, the lesser needed city services. Instead, we get a paragraph in the packet that simply states, well, it's possible to reallocate funds from other programs and departments to bolster public safety resources. There's a point where diminishing returns set in. Well. I don't know, what's that level? What are those alternatives? Um, you know, we could use one extra police officer. I know it affects me directly just having a home invasion, a violent home invasion right across from my house. Um, I'd like to have one more police officer instead of two community engagement coordinators. So I think there are decisions that we can make and decisions that we could have made in the budging, and that's just the start. Um, this isn't stuff that just happened in the last year. It's been for years. Uh, and again, the budget workshop, other meetings, I spoke, other people talked about it, and it's just not done. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, we need to work more on looking at where we're spending money right now in the city and where we're making projections on things like sales tax, as if the sales tax is not going to be this thing that's going to come forever for us. 
We're going to grow and we're going to need even more people. Is our sales tax going to grow in proportion with all of the, the needs that we need in public safety or are we going to go back to the well for another quarter percent? So I, I, I think we need to be real careful with this and, you know, spend another $300,000 on a failed thing. It just seems not like a good idea uh, without an alternative that we have not seen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to let Ron go next and give Andrew a chance to come up to the front, please. <laughs> okay. okay. Go, go ahead, Ron. <laughs> um, I've done some thinking about this. I've talked to a few people on the days. And, you know, this is going to be targeted at public safety. We have issues with public safety here. At the uh, last uh, meeting with the school board and, and here, we said we need more SROs. They want more. S they want an SRO in every school. I'm hoping that someday that bill will get through uh, Sacramento, but I, we can't wait for that. I don't think we need more police officers. We need more SROs. Uh, the last time we decided how many police officers our city needed was, I was told, was back in 1986, and now we're in 2024. Uh, so the number that was requested then is the number that we are today. I think we need to re -look, look at that and and decide again uh, how many we really need. Our crime has increased in this city uh, because of different issues, mostly Proposition 47 and, and, and the like. So I think, uh, you know, this should be something that we should seriously consider. So I'm not going to fight against it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Andrew Lopez. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, uh, <laughs> office. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed. I'm off to a rough start here. But uh, city, uh, city officials and community members, those that are present and here online, my name is um, Andrew Lopez. I am the president of the Gilroy Police Officers Association, and we would support uh, this measure uh, aimed at enhancing our community safety and well-being. This proposal centers around two critical areas. Uh, improving response times for calls for service and strengthening our outreach um, efforts. Um, from first-hand experience working at the patrol level and responding to calls for service, I have seen and heard the complaints of my community members um, asking what took me so long and trying to explain to them that there were other higher priority calls that came before them and thus delayed their call for service um, is not good enough a good enough answer for them, especially when they're asking for uh, service or um, you know, a, a response to their um, vehicle being vandalized. Uh, you know, sometimes we as police officers want to help our community, and I can tell you from firsthand that the officers that are out there right now are working very diligently and very hard to provide that highest service that we can from our, uh, from our agency to our community. And we value um, our community, and we are entrusted with their safety. And by allowing or by uh, proposing this tax measure, and to get those additional bodies that we that would help us in our patrol levels as well as community outreach. Um, currently, our department does a lot of community outreach with the South County Youth Task Force and with other um, community-based organizations to be out there amongst our community and providing, you know, um, Citizens Academy, uh, Coffee with a Cop. A lot of those partnerships are very crucial for building and maintaining that community trust that we have um, currently. and not allowing um, officers those positions would uh, you know be very detrimental to our community uh, also having the adequate response times for officers to be able to be proactive as well as answering those low level calls for service compared to the high priority calls for service would be very beneficial to our community uh, in summary our support for this proposal aims to enhance both uh, our uh, urgent response capabilities and community relations. By investing in these areas, we can see a we can create a safer, more connected Gilroy for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other public speakers? No, there are not. Okay, so I'm going to come back to council, starting with Council Member Armendaris. Thank you, um, Jimmy. You mentioned earlier. Um, looking at uh, copying what other success other cities have done successfully. Um, do we know if those cities engaged consultants or, you know, folks to run a, a, a campaign? And if so, how did they fund it? 
Well, I can't, I can't speak for uh, – we looked at, uh, you know, I believe it was San Carlos or another city like that, but I can't speak to the consultant. But I've been involved in probably four or five ballot measures in my career, and we've done it both ways uh, to different varying levels of success. I, I think the value comes more from the effort that's put in the information side from us than consultants because consultants, uh, they're not – they're trying to – tell you what they think you should do, but this isn't a, you know, this is more, I think, a personal type of ballot measure mm -hmm. where we're trying to communicate to the community, the service level. Uh, so we don't want to, I mean, I would not, um, I'm not going to recommend that we do put a lot of money into consultants and polling because I think this is a very much a mm -hmm. grassroots sales tax measure for Gilroy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I have some uh, questions and comments, so I don't see any, any other council member on my board, so I'm going to go ahead and go and say, um, is it correct that quarter percent is the most that we can raise? So we can't, as one speaker said, we can't do another quarter percent next year or a year after that, right? I know. Yeah, that, that's a legislative limit. It, the exactly. only way to go above that is if the state of California legislature it, gave us approval. Exactly. So I just I just wanted that said, that the quarter percent is the most that we can do. We can't, can't do more than that, and it's not per year. It's that period. Also... Um, for anybody in the public who d may not know, the reason why it needs two-thirds vote to pass is because we're making it specific to public safety. If we were just making a general sales tax request that we said, well, we're, we're, we're just telling you we're going to put it to public safety, but we don't actually have to, then that would require only 50 percent. And for those who've been in Gilroy a long time, you remember that that is exactly what happened with Measure F. It started out being specific to public safety, the polling was showing that it would not make the two-thirds, so they dropped it to a general, and then it failed even worse. So that, that was what happened back then. So that's the two-thirds thing. And then lastly, um, my, my reason for supporting that we put this on the ballot is to give the voters that choice. It really is up to them, and it is going to come down to how well we explain it. We need to explain it. It needs to be clear, you know, in, in the ballot, in our argument, whatever, not argument for or against, but I mean in the impartial, whatever it is. We need to make sure that the public understands what the finance, which is something I intend to do, because I know what our finances are and where the money goes. And that, to me, is the key to how we help this move forward. But I'm support, I, I intend to support it because I want the people to have that choice instead of saying, why don't we have this and why don't we have that? Council member, I'm going to go to Council Member Klein. Council Member Renderis, you're on here still. Are you meant to be? No, I'm not. Okay, Council Member Klein. I think it's, um, again, not being in this position before, but in going through this process and getting to this point, and understanding, looking at past history of why we got here and why we've been struggling with the issues that we're faced with, I'm open to at least looking at this, even though we've got to have the information, we've got to give that to the public so they understand that. Uh, I'm kind of pessimistic as, as a voter, just my history, but at the same time, understanding the challenges. And I think with that, also looking at what options are there for us, too, in the event, because it is a high threshold to, to get this approved. So we have to look at both sides of it as we go through this process. I'm okay with going through the process to see how we can make this work. But there is looking at big picture of what other options there might be in the case that this wouldn't work. So. Right. Right. The voters decide. Okay. Um, so seeing no other questions from council, then we need to give direction to staff. Is there a majority support to go with staff's recommended <laughs> allocation of funding for now, which is the 25%, 40%, 25% infrastructure, 40% police, 35% fire? Okay, as opposed to the second one, which is 55% police, 25% fire, and 20 Do we need a motion for that? I don't think so. This is just direction, right? Direction. Yeah, it's just okay. direction. So my question is, yeah, does the council majority support staff's recommended first, the first yes. one? Okay. Then I think that's all, all you need to bring us back on July 29th, or what else? No, I, I've written all the questions I've received, and we'll get going if... Uh, and you'll bring back details of the oversight committee, that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. We had a majority, yes. Yeah. Oh, were you a no? I didn't even look your way, because I saw a majority and just called it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Thank you, everyone. Now we go to item 11, which we have none. Item 12, City Administrator's Report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just have two quick reports. Uh, one is to convey some information from the County Office of Diversion and Reentry Services. April is Second Chance Month, and uh, this is a program that helps reduce barriers for formerly incarcerated individuals. And we have a reentry center right here in Gilroy, uh, which is over on Murray Avenue. And they have an open house on April 18th from 11 to 2. If you have no idea what they do, which some of us did not for quite a while, uh, go over on that open house and they'll tell you a lot of the great programs that do, they do to help folks reentering society, to give them support, job opportunities, and uh, learn more about what they, they do. Uh, it's a great program and we've, we've certainly learned a lot over the last couple of months. And, and uh, April 18th would be... Is a Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah. It's a Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second, I wanted to thank everyone who uh, joined uh, us at San Ysidro Park on Saturday for our cleanup. Uh, one of the nice things about cleaning up the parks now is we're finding less big stuff, so we're picking up <laughs> a lot of little stuff. A lot of bottle caps, a lot of water bottle tops, things like that. Uh, so thank you for those who attended. And then probably our biggest cleanup of the, of the year is on May 18th, which is, is the U.S. Creek cleanup. I've seen some of you out there before. And uh, the toilet flushing, you're oh, not doing I, it. I like, <laughs> thought I said something. <laughs> and uh, that is uh, biggest uh, attendance we'll get. A lot of community groups. So if you have a nonprofit or, or someone who wants to come help us, we'll, we'll we'll find plenty of big stuff for you out there. So. Yes, and we do get them quite often. Will there be a mattress um, cleanup thing this year or this yes. spring? Okay, great. Yes, I'll, I'll bring that back as part of the CA report on the 15th. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That concludes my report. Thank yeah. you. And thank you for mentioning the, the reentry center. The, the lots, we learned a lot on sat, Saturday's coffee. We had that here, and it's just we, we have some really great services in Gilroy. Okay, city attorney's report. No report. All right, uh, Julie, you want to take us into closed session? Okay, so for the um, anticipated litigation under the OGO, I need to read this. Based on the advice of its legal counsel and upon a motion and vote in open session to assert the attorney-client privilege to confer with and receive advice from its legal counsel regarding pending litigation, when the discussion in open session concerning these matters would likely and unavoidably prejudice the, pre, uh, the position of the city in that litigation. And it, we're coming under the one section about threatened litigation. So um, you need to vote now. Uh, we're going to vote to go in closed session, right? Yeah, but we don't have to vote once we're in there. Right. So yes, everybody. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so done. And now let's take a five-minute break, and then we will reconvene. <laughs>